chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, joined here uh, by my colleagues and lead sponsors, City Council Lodge, Aaron Murphy, and also City Council President Ed Flynn. I know other colleagues will be arriving, uh, and they'll be uh, speaking as they arrive uh, and or in the order that they arrive. Um, I want to let folks know that this uh, hearing uh, is being recorded. It's uh, being live streamed on boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN 82, Fios Channel 964. We'll also be taking public testimony uh, at the end of the hearing. If you're interested in testifying with us uh, and you're here in the chamber, please, there's a sign-in sheet as you come in the door. Uh, and uh, Or if folks are watching and they would like to testify virtually, you can email uh, Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N dot Kavanaugh, K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H, at boston.gov for the link. Now, today's hearing is on docket 0888, order for hearing to ensure all incidents of bullying and violence are properly reported to ensure a safe environment for all students and staff at the Boston Public Schools. The matter was sponsored by City Councilor at Lodge Aaron Murphy and referred to the committee on July 13th. Uh, with that, I'm going to allow my Thank you. Uh, colleague and lead sponsor an opening statement uh, followed by Council President. We're going to get right into it. Awesome. And it's great to see you, Superintendent. And then we actually introduce our guest, obviously, where uh, we have our Superintendent, uh, Superintendent Mary Skipper, relatively new on the job, um, and but uh, Looks good. Uh, working extremely hard and seeing her a little bit of everywhere across the city as an at Lodge Council. Uh, Neva Coakley uh, Grice, who's the Chief of BPS Safety Services, who I know I go back a lot of years from my days back as an Assistant DA. And then uh, Jody uh, Elgi, the Senior Director of Succeed Boston. So that will be our panel. Uh, and then we're also going to ask, uh, after the panel, we're going to ask Pastor David Searles, who's Boston SOS, which is safety in our schools. And then I know that we have folks that have asked to testify or participate, and uh, we'll be calling folks to come down and testify uh, after that. So without further ado, uh, my colleague and lead sponsor, City Council, Aaron Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for coming back, and thank you, Superintendent Skipper, it's great to see you. I hope the first month has been, it's been busy. It has been busy. I've been seeing you, yeah. So as a former BPS student, a former BPS parent, and also a teacher for 24 years, I um, know the importance of social emotional learning. More social workers and guidance counselors in arts and athletic opportunities for our students are necessary. When I um, said my maiden speech back at the beginning of the school year, I was advocating for mental health supports across the city, but especially in our schools, and also um, filed to advocate for more funding for our athletics and arts. So I absolutely, as a teacher, mom, you know, know that the social emotional wellness of our children and how we wrap them up in the, you know, supports they need to be ready to learn is so important. And I am hopeful and. Um, Great things are always happening in the BPS schools. I knew that as a teacher there, but we have to also address when things aren't going right. So one of the reasons, and I do just want to reiterate that, you know, I did not call this hearing to discuss how we can help prevent incidents of violence. I know we have had hearings about that. We'll continue to not just need to have hearings, but work with the school and support. And I know we supported in many ways in the budget cycle, all of our colleagues were really advocating strongly to make sure that there is money in the budget for all of those programs and supports for our students. But, you know, it's an important issue and we continue to have that critical discussion, but much of this discussion at our last hearing was on the use of metal detectors in schools and other, other things we're doing. So I'm getting, and I know my colleagues also, and we just um, spoke about that, Jody. that as counselors, we get calls and we get text messages of videos of kids and fights and things happening in the schools and concerned parents from bullying, you know, a young kid feeling like no one wants to eat lunch with them to someone being shot on the stairs at Bark High. So the range we know in a system like this is huge, but every parent that calls us, we have to react. So we de definitely want to know, especially with the new administration coming in, what things are going to be different, what things have been in place, and how you as the new leader of our school, working with everyone, and you were here before, I know, so I will remind everyone that you're back with us, so that's great. But And then there's the DESI audit, right? So real numbers came out, and we know that many times families, students, politicians um, feel like the data isn't always shared 
clearly or it's not transparent. But the audit that came out um, from the State Department of Elementary and Secondi Secondary Education reported that Boston Public School System does not support the physical, social, and emotional well-being of all students and does not ensure a safe environment for our students. So many people, when they read that report, and that's one of the first sentences they're reading, I think many were surprised. So the district we need to make sure is managing, responding to, and you know, is responsive to parents, but also staff. We know that the staff also isn't always feeling safe. And I will say before we let you jump right in with what is happening, but the acts of violence in BPS include bullying, sexual assaults, um, and when we had a hearing on sexual assault a few months ago, we, I had pulled up the data. And in 2018-19 school year, which just to make sure everyone remembers, that was the last full in-person school year before COVID hit. Because COVID over the last two and a half, three years has really made it hard to look at data. It's kind of apples to oranges now, so I know you all know how to kind of pull that apart. But in 2018-19, there were 243 reported cases of bullying in BPS. Last school year, when we were back in person, there were 440. That's up 80% of reported. And the concern we hear often, too, is that not all of these incidences are reported or followed through. And sexual assaults are up 67% from the same school year range. In 2018-19, there were 439. And last school year, there were 744. And I know you all know it, but I do just want to um, remind that we're here also, like I said, it could be the kid who feels like he doesn't have someone to have his snack or recess with, and then there's students and families realizing their kids are in buildings, that there's loaded guns. So it's a range that I you know, commend you all for handling it, but making sure that we don't forget the severity of what's happening. Because there's the stabbing at Burke High last month, and then there was the shooting just a couple weeks ago. A mother and her daughter were arrested for assaulting an officer at Excel High School after attempting to confront another student. Concerned parents and guardians are removing their students, their children from BPS. And we see that, we talk about it a lot, about enrollment is down, people are moving out of the city, schools are the one big factor when you have children that keeps families in the city. We did recess our hearing because the chair and I wanted to have, um, we were hoping um, Drew Eccleson, but then we know you started. So thank you for being here. So we know we can get great answers from you. But with this hearing today, I hope to hear from all of you about the procedures that maybe have changed or if you could remind, like maybe they're the same, but you're gonna make sure they're enforced to make sure. I do think that I often say, even if the numbers aren't up, right, we can debate data, but if families, students, staff don't feel safe, if it's true or not, we know in many cases it is true that that's enough to have to put on the brakes and really address it. How are we making sure that grandparents, aunts, uncles, moms, dads who are going to work and leaving their students, I knew as a teacher my number one job was to keep my students safe. My second job was to teach them. And so we need to make sure that it's not just pockets of school in certain neighborhoods who have the luxury, which it should never be a luxury, of a safe environment where they're thriving, that every student. So if you're assigned to Burke High or you're assigned to South Boston High, Excel High, the Henderson, that you know that you're going to be safe. So I'll end there and looking forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Chair recognizes City Council President Ed Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to you and to Councilor Murphy for bringing us together and to the school superintendent, Mary Skipper, for being here with, with your team as well. During the budget cycle recently, I know all of my colleagues advocated and supported as much funding as we possibly could for various programs for BPS for students, but especially for mental health counseling and for um, social services for the BPS student, but also for the BPS family as well. That's, some, that's a commitment I know this body will continue to make going forward is supporting our BPS students and, and families. Um, I also want to have that same level of hard work and focus 
on public safety as well inside our schools and and outside of the school. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about how we're, how we're working together to make sure we provide the safest possible environment for learning for our, stu for our students, for our teachers, and for our BPS families. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty, and thank you, Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Councilor President Flynn, and uh, good morning, Superintendent. It's great to see you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for, obviously, the uh, your leadership on this issue. I know it's important. It was great to see you over the Greater Love Tabernacle Church in partnership. Uh, very refreshing, frankly, yes, um, to see you along with our mayor and our police commissioner and so many uh, community and civic leaders to address this issue because, like you've referenced, it's obviously the schools are sort of you know microcosms of, of, of our neighborhood and of our city. So I know that you're passionate about this issue. We're, um, we're uh, thankful that you're here and you have the floor and to proceed in any fashion you want with uh, very capable uh, folks with you, with Neva and, and Jody. So, great. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Flaherty and Council Murphy, for bringing us together today. Um, I'm joined here uh, by my colleagues uh, Neva Coakley, Grice, and Jody Elgy, uh, as you introduced. I'd also like to point out a few people that are in the audience who are my team: Fran Johnson, our Deputy Chief of Safety Services. Jillian Kelton, who is our Chief of Student Support, Anna Tavares, our Deputy Superintendent of Family and Community Advancement, and Dacia Campbell, our Assistant Superintendent, Division of, Opera uh, Division of Schools and Operations. Uh, first, I just want to begin by thanking Mayor Wu, uh, District Attorney Hayden, Commissioner Cox, and several of you who came together on Tuesday with members of Boston's faith-based community to address the recent violence in our city. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about what's happening in our city, in our schools, and the devastating impact that it's having on our young people. Mm -hmm. Certainly for BPS, we've had several difficult events that have impacted BPS and our community directly over the past few weeks. We're deeply saddened by the recent loss of one of our students as a result of gun violence. While this tragedy happened over a weekend, the impact on the school community is just as devastating. The loss of a young person's life is the loss of all that's possible. In the first week of school, another one of our students was severely injured right in front of the Burke with gun violence. In each of these situations, the healing and support needed continues to be provided by our team and by the trauma response unit from the neighborhood in the city. And that goes on to today. And then there was the brutal attack in Franklin Park. And I, we just want to, on the school side, send our very best to Jean McGuire that she continued to heal as the first woman of color on the Boston School Committee. Her work has changed the lives of thousands of Bostonians. She really has helped to break down barriers for people of color, and she's a pillar in our community and our educational community. All of these incidents took place within the first month that I've begun as superintendent. Violence in our neighborhoods, surrounding our schools, and in our schools is impacting every day the lives of our students. Just this week, and it's Wednesday, we have Thursday. We had four different situations in which schools were placed in safe mode because of a threat in the surrounding community that has an impact on students trying to learn. We have to stop to imagine what this feels like for our students who are waking up every day, traveling to and from school, sitting in classrooms trying to focus on lessons. Every death and injury that we hear about may be somebody that those students knew were related to, a peer, a friend. Every situation of violence they witness creates a chronic trauma response for them, causes them to be afraid, causes them to feel the need to protect themselves. It causes them to be disengaged and distracted from the job which they have to do, which is to be a student and to be a child. I often talk about this concept of the whole child. Our students are living beings. It's not just about academics. It's not just about social emotional learning or just about how they show up in the classroom. We have to ensure that our educators, like Councilor Murphy testified, that they understand that we need to look at our students through all lenses and be able to support them, make sure they're safe, both physically and emotionally, and provide them with the resources that they need to thrive. This is our, always our top priority as a district, it needs to be, and it's certainly my top priority as a superintendent coming in. Since returning to BPS just four weeks ago, I've been working with my team to get caught up to speed on how the district's changed since I left seven years ago. 
My experience as a principal at Tech Boston Academy for a decade and as the network superintendent for all of the high schools makes me acutely aware of how important the physical and emotional safety of our students are and how excellent communication protocols and reporting to keep everyone safe is critical. That's why we're reviewing everything as a team and we're listening. We're examining what's working for students and families and assessing what we need to do better. We had a recent visit from the Council of Great City Schools that was connected to the Department of Education's report and our systemic improvement report. Um, the Council of Great City Schools represents the largest districts in the country and they're doing a full report on safety in our schools and they'll make recommendations and they'll share best practices from other districts for us. I met with them as did the team and they did very thorough interviews throughout the district and at particular schools. We expect that report back in later November and we're presenting it to school committee in December. And I'm happy to share those dates um, with the council as well. We also welcome the chance today to hear about some of the work, or for you to hear about some of the work that we're actively doing to answer questions on specifically our anti-bullying efforts, our continued work on improving school safety, on incident communications, and on information sharing. And we see that also as an opportunity to hear recommendations, concerns, questions that we need to do better diligence on and to answer. Before I ask my team, since this is the first time I've had the honor to address the council uh, since returning, I just want to leave a few thoughts. Um, everywhere I go as superintendent, people ask me, how are you feeling about the first month of school? And um, why are you feeling that way? And my response is that I'm feeling incredibly optimistic about what can happen in this district and city. I have not seen an alignment since probably a decade ago, where we have a mayor who's truly committed to resourcing and supporting and making priority the Boston Public Schools, or a council that shares that agenda and keeps the kids in the center, or a school committee that's laser focused on student outcome. Everywhere I go, a village of businesses, nonprofits, CBOs, post secondary saying, How can we help? And a district where our staff is really saying this is our job, there are no excuses to making sure that every student in the Boston Public Schools succeeds, is safe, and has the opportunities. So for me, that speaks of hope. Are we there yet? No. But we will get there. And we'll get there by working together, which is why I appreciate the Council's partnership in bringing this important topic together today. So thank you. Thank you. For that. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jody Elgy. She's going to begin. We have a very brief presentation to give you some of the content. Great. Welcome, Jody. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you all. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Flaherty Murphy and Chair Flynn, thank you for bringing us all together to talk about this really important issue around bullying and safety in the schools. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to share our work. And as Councillor Murphy and I spoke about briefly, and Chair Flynn, I think that this is an opportunity for us to work together so that we can best serve students and families across the city, and, um, and that we can really be partners in addressing the concerns in a timely manner so that we can resolve these issues quickly. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Succeed Boston at the Counseling and Intervention Center. Some of you may have known it at the as the Barron Center. Mm -hmm. um, so we are responsible for bullying prevention and intervention across the district, and we've been doing that work since 2010. Um, I'll talk with you a little bit more about that, but I want to tell you first about the work that we're doing at Succeed Boston which is serving students who have violated the code of conduct, so that's a tier three. And our program is very unique. Boston has um, dedicated resources for 36 years now for students to come to the counseling center when they've been suspended and receive social emotional learning skills. They have an opportunity to reset to think about their behavior and think about how they may be able to repair the harm upon return to school. 
What's important to note is that everyone here knows that out-of-school suspensions do not support students. So out-of-school suspensions where students are at home or on the streets only lead to increased um, danger for them. So the counseling center is something that is very unique across the country, actually, and we have dedicated these resources. So um, we, I, I just want to give a little shout out about that work. Um, in addition to that, we are responsible for bullying prevention and intervention across the district. We have a multidisciplinary team. Sorry, I didn't forward the. We have a multidisciplinary team that includes staff at Succeed Boston, the Office of Equity when a complaint is bias based, safety services if it involves some sort of a physical assault or physical danger. Welcome centers are partners with us. We, um, we receive reports from them on a regular basis. And also family school engagement. We do follow up with the operational leaders and assistant superintendents, as well as social workers and district social workers. Our student support is pretty broad. We have a bullying prevention. We, have, uh, we provide bullying prevention and intervention workshops at Succeed. We provide bias-based speech, cyberbullying programs, and in addition to the suspension program, we also uh, offer a voluntary one-day workshop for students who are more at risk for perhaps um, increased behavior that may lead to a code of conduct violation. So that's more of a, a prevention work, although it is a tier two. We have just launched a, a new student ambassador program. We were lucky enough to receive a, a substantial donation from a private, um, I guess I would call him and his family angel investors. And um, we are able to bring back our student ambassador program. We um, encourage students to report to a trusted adult, so nurse, counselor, teacher, administrator, family for sure and also call or text the Safe Space and Bullying Hotline. So anonymous reporting, I was thinking about our last hearing and the conversation about, or the comment that people are sometimes afraid to report. I wanna be clear that people can report on the hotline by text or if they call, and it can be anonymous. So if there's any concern about retaliation, we will honor that request and I can guarantee that, that that confidentiality will be upheld. Um, Councilor Murphy, you asked and referenced the bullying data, and you're absolutely right that the numbers are up substantially. In fact, this year, um, we have had 165 reports compared to 43, um, oh, compared to 64 last year, year to date. So reporting is up, and I want to emphasize that we see that as a positive. And um, we see that as a positive because we're getting the message out to schools, to families, to staff, that bullying is not acceptable, and that everyone has a right to report, and all students have a right to be in an environment where they, say, where they feel safe, welcomed, and can thrive. Sam. Yeah, I'm just, I, I just want to comment on that. Uh, sorry, I just want to comment on that. Uh, we need to see where the actual crest is. Mm -hmm. So while we believe that there, by varying the different reporting mechanisms, we're getting more reports, which is a good thing, so that we know what's going on, we obviously want to see where the crest is, and then we want to see that the interventions we're doing are actually lowering them. But we don't know where that crest is, to just be perfectly frank. So that's why we will see, as with any time you launch a report, a reporting system, particularly an anonymous one, you will see that uptick. Our hope is that it crests, and then we can really, with our interventions and preventions, really start to kind of knock that down. Um, and I, you know, I, I think uh, Council's urging right, was anonymous. I know I've had conversations with both of you that, you know, the importance of parents and students having lots of different kinds of vehicles and opportunities to be able to report. So 
Thank you for that. That's a perfect example where recommendations that you make and others make help inform our practice. Thank you, and, Superintendent. And Superintendent, obviously, if I, if I may just add, uh, I, I think part of the part of the frustration, and obviously predates your tenure, um, a lot of this, even some of the, 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 the issues that we're discussing today were really sort of from last year mm -hmm. and or the year before that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times what we were hearing was that it was either not reported or it wasn't dealt with mm -hmm. by BPS Central mm -hmm. in a prompt, appropriate manner. Um, you can almost sort of see, I, I, have, I have numbers here that had school year 21, 22 that said 26, and um, Jody just reported 64. And then school year 22, 23, we had 43, but we're now hearing 165. I think a big piece of this is being forthcoming, yeah. recognizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would guess I'm trying to say, like, it may not necessarily be an uptick. My opinion, this has been going on, Superintendent, for the last however long, several years. But it's been sort of nothing to see here, folks. Oh, that didn't really happen. And everyone's doing the habita, 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 because they didn't want to be on the radar for BPS Central. Right. That obviously came to... Um, to light, particularly during uh, all of the, the DESE involvement. So the f what I'm excited to hear is we've got a superintendent and a team of folks that are now going to be forthcoming with students and families and elected representatives in the community because, as we said the other day at the Great Love Tabernacle Church, we're all in this together, right. and there's been a period of time where we're all working in separate silos, and someone being able to harness all of that, you, the mayor, obviously uh, the commissioner, that's, that's a healthy thing for our city. It's a healthy thing for obviously our schools and for families. And so, um, yeah, I, did, I, I just wanted to know because it may, you know, you're just sitting in this chair, you're just kind of getting um, getting started, and all of a sudden there's this big uptick. I don't think there's this big uptick. I think what that is is shedding the light on the fact that it's kind of been going on for a while, and your predecessor and or the team that had been here before you was was not being forthcoming, and they weren't addressing it in an appropriate manner. And that was the frustration we were getting from students and parents regularly across the city. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear from, from, uh, from Reverend Sears uh, when he comes down uh, as safety in our schools and he's a parent in the system and he was seeing things with his own eyes plus he was connecting with parents across the city. There was a huge disconnect over the last several years between what was happening in the classrooms, kids being bullied and assaulted on the way to school, kids being bullied and assaulted at school, kids being bullied and assaulted on the way home from school, and for some reason, we didn't have a bullying problem. We didn't have kids getting assaulted problem. It was it, it was it just defied logic because we were getting mm -hmm. the calls from sure. parents. And then we had instances where kids were actually hurt and yeah. teachers and principals were making a decision as to whether or not it rose to the level of should we call 911, should we get this person some, uh, some, some medical attention. And more often than not, it was the parents that then would have to take their child later on in the afternoon to the hospital only to learn that they got a certain grade concussion or you know, it was treated earlier in the day with an ice pack yeah. or worse. And then, then they have to go from the hospital to the police department to fill out a report. None of that should have been happening. At that school level, yeah. we should have been making an immediate determination that this was a serious incident or this person was assaulted. We need to get the medical attention now. And then we obviously need to address with the other issues that Jody is sort of describing. That wasn't happening, Superintendent. Yeah. So I know you're coming into this, sure. and you're sort of going to kind of get straddled with some leftover, I guess, I don't even know what you call it, baggage from, mm -hmm. um, from unreported, undetected, unresponded to. Um, and unfortunately, obviously, that's yesterday, I guess. We're trying to move forward mm -hmm. with you. We, we believe in you, and we, uh, and we know that you've taken this issue seriously, and, and we want to work with you on it. But I just wanted to at least call out sort of what, what has been happening, and I think our frustration as a legislative body and trying to get the answers from BPS. Lots of swerving, lots of bobbing and weaving, lots of numbers that kind of really weren't, weren't really making sense because we were getting numbers and, and, and hearing about incidents across the board. So I just wanted to opine on yeah. that a little bit. So we appreciate you know, your efforts right to date and, and your leadership around this issue. And I need to say that we haven't had leadership on this issue mm -hmm. for a long time. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I think, um, I think a couple of things. I think one is that Data is the way that we improve practice, right? It, in the classroom, at school level, at district level. So this is data that our team is 100% committed to looking at on a regular basis. When we see a pattern or an uptick or a trend, part of the hotline and part of putting it into central repository is to see those patterns so we can appropriately respond. I would also say that in a, in a district the size of BPS, 
it is imperative that we continue to train and retrain multiple times a year our staff. There's so much that goes on, so much turnover with staff, um, school leaders, teachers, that we cannot assume that just because we distribute something that it's actually happening or understood. So we've actually had at least three calls, all leader calls, with all the principals to offer the opportunity for questions, to review the protocols. This past week we did an incident command one where we talked specifically about communication protocols. We revamped all of them, um, made them much more streamlined. Uh, they're actually in the appendix, but you'll see that based on the incident, there's, there's like a very uh, strict kind of incident command chain of who gets notified, when they get notified. Um, Chief Coakley or uh, uh, Dacia Campbell could, um, can speak to it. Uh, very specifically, but the point is that school leaders have so much on their plate mm -hmm. that giving them multiple opportunities to hear the information, process it, and then be able to ask questions about it. And then I think one of the most important things to, that we've built in is what we call an after action review. So when an incident happens, how do we learn from our responses what worked well, what did not work well, both at the school side and the district side? That's the way we improve. It's just like in a classroom, you do an observation, and then the most important thing is the dialogue that happens between the teacher and the, and the observer to say, what did I see? What happened? Did it go the way I thought it would? What else could I have tried? So that after action review is critical, and we're committed as a team, um, both at the school level and the district level, to that to improve our practice. So, um, if I could jump in here. So the data that we did receive, it does say that in the 2021-2022 school year, there were only 26 reports. We have 440 that we were given at the last hearing. So that number is very different. Um, and that was given from BPS. And then the firearms, was there only one firearm in the 2021-22 school year? in our schools, because now it's saying zero for this school year. Have we had no incidents with firearm this year so far? Uh, three, no, three, uh, no, we haven't, uh, not with a firearm. We have with pellet guns. Okay. Um, so what you'll see, uh, there, there is a difference. Yeah. However, they're both dangerous yep. um, because of what they imply, right? right? So we have not had any um, active uh, uh, firearm. Yeah the bullets and others that were found in Correct, and I, just different. to underscore um, on that category, we broke down a little further what we call kind of dangerous weapons. Mm -hmm. There is like a miscellaneous category. That can be anything that can create injury. Yeah. Could be an umbrella tip, could be scissors. How about this gavel? Right. Could be the gavel. Um, yeah, yeah. There's not a clean bucket for that, so we call that uh, dangerous weapons. Right. Um, and you'll see the knives. You know, the other thing we clarified, a knife is a weapon. Right. A knife is a weapon. So, um, you know, you'll see, uh, you know, in the slides as we go through them, we have a, a protocol of three different types of incident and how we respond. So Jody? I, I just wanted to respond to the data question. So you are correct that it was 591 last year. When I said 64, it was year to date. Oh, I know, it, for it, this it, school year. Okay. But yes. we have a printout here. It this might not be the same that said 26 for 2021, 2020. Okay. 26, oh, oh, 26 of the 40, of the 64 were found to be bullying. bullying. Those were confirmed, 26 of the 64 okay. last year. Yes, thank you for asking about that. And then 594 is a total? For the school year, yes. So after, after uh, the Mission Hill report, we were flooded with, uh, with, with uh, bullying calls and And the um, Boston Arts Academy when the students went out and had their mm -hmm. rally because they were right. concerned. Mm -hmm. Last year during the budget process, I, the number we had was there was 1,925 incidents at BPS. Is that, that's still an accurate number, right? 1,925 incidents in the, dur, this, was, this came out during the budget process yeah. mm -hmm. for um, the previous school year. Yes. And then I think Aaron was 700 and 740 were, uh, were sexual, sexual assault, assault, sexual assault Specific in nature. To, yep, last school. And then so in this sheet here, right, it, says a, it says a total of 145 allegations of sexual assault have been reported to the Office of Equity this year to date. Are we talking about just in the first several weeks of the school year or is this left over from last season? So I think we, 
I think we um, wanted to just take the opportunity to distinguish between sexual assault and what we call sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. So Jody, if you can just kind of give the examples. Sure, so it actually goes to our next slide, okay. which is bias-based bullying. And, and what we're talking about with sexual misconduct, it could be, it's, it's very different than sexual assault. So those were reported incidents of sexual misconduct. And that could be anything from a kindergarten student touching the bottom of another student. Mm -hmm. And that that would be filed with the Office of Equity as a sexual misconduct investigation. So it can range from that all the way to the most serious, yeah, like which we would Hill. refer to yeah. as sexual assault. Students being raped at the Mission Hill School right. repeatedly. Correct. Right, right. right. Yeah. And so, so it's really important to clarify those two different things because a sexual assault does have a criminal, um, mm -hmm. a, a criminal aspect to that, mm -hmm. and sexual misconduct is what the Office of Equity right. investigates. And let me ask you, why does it go to the Office of Equity, and why wouldn't it go to Chief... Um, Neva Copley Grice, because of, and then let a trained detective um, with experience in deciphering as to whether or not it should be a certain level. Why does it go to equity when you have someone that doesn't have any sort of background in investigatory piece of it or determining what something is sexual or what level, what tier it is? My advice would be it should go to Chief um, Neva Copley Grice first. And then she makes a determination, or her team makes a determination based on the years of experience dealing with sexual assault and mm -hmm. child abuse and all those things. And then comes back and says, this, is a, this, is, this should go the equity route versus this should go the, this is, this is a more serious type of thing. So I, don't, I just want to know why, why, why does it all get shuffled off to equity to make a decision? And I think in there lies a little bit of the danger of what we're seeing with principals making a decision whether they should call 911 or whether they should bring in uh, medical assistance for a student as opposed to saying, ah, just give a nice pack and go down to the nurse's office. Mm -hmm. Ah, geez, you mm -hmm. know, it's actually, it's only a little, it's only a little blood. Uh, he'll be fine, right? I, I don't think that we should be in that gray area. Mm -hmm. If we're determining as to whether or not something is of sexual, uh, sexual assault in nature and we're going to make a determination, frankly, I, I think we should be going to folks that have training and experience and, and, and should go to the chief. For clarification around that, sec any, any reported allegation of sexual violence goes directly to the Office of Safety. Sexual misconduct, the Office of Equity is very well trained in, uh, in the investigation of sexual misconduct. Uh, but anything, again, just to your point, mm -hmm. Councillor Flaherty, if it, is involved, if it involves sexual violence, it, it goes immediately. There. Might be good to give further examples yeah. of like what Does that include under? unwarranted touching? So, you know, right. 16, 17 year old kids and something happens and they're, they, that would go to the chief, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sexual assault go to Boston Police. Examples of what misconduct and then it goes to Boston Names. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so sexual misconduct would include um, calling someone a B, for instance. Um, sexual misconduct in the past might be referred to as sexual harassment. Right, so it may be a student is looking someone up and down. Sexual mis misconduct with young children, we see a lot of it, yeah. and a lot of it is developmentally appropriate. You know, we want to teach those students, provide them with resources so they understand boundaries and that they're able to, to uh, not escalate their behavior as they get older. So those, that's the vast majority of the, of the reports of sexual misconduct. And it, does a significant amount of them take place over text or Instagram, or like that, the cyber piece oh, of it? Oh, the social media is right. fairly out of control. The amount of time that we spend unpacking social media coming into the schools from all hours, and it's the, probably the number one thing parents can do is yeah. really control the phone, take a look at the phone, what's happening, who are your children talking to, We've gotten many, um, and I know my colleagues have also in my office, of parents calling because they saw something on TikTok, mm -hmm. and many TikTok. times it became true. Exactly. And they were afraid to attend, or there was TikTok challenges, right. or mm -hmm. they were showing mm -hmm. the, you know, the fighting in the bathroom right. that wasn't mm -hmm. being reported and trying to figure out what school it was from. Yeah, last year, uh, in general, um, just in districts, social media, uh, particularly with TikTok, there were these alleged challenges. Mm -hmm to you know, do harm in bathrooms, destruction, et cetera. I, you know, I know my counterparts, I spoke with regularly about this and the amount of damage that was done in buildings 
uh, was incredible. But you know, that's like a perfect example where we appreciate when a parent will alert us if they see something on social media, or somebody does, because you know, we're, while we monitor social media, it can't be 24 seven. Right. So often knowing something before school starts, before the kids are coming in, helps us. Or if an inappropriate video gets posted, we can get it down pretty quickly by reporting it. And then when you have, as again, um, Jody had mentioned, obviously the sort of the out of school um, suspension situation. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of situations where the, you might have someone that's sort of, it's chronic, I guess, so someone continues to bully mm -hmm. and then all efforts have sort of been exhausted through, you know, multiple efforts and whether it's mm -hmm. restorative justice, et cetera. Um, we get a lot of situations, at least in the last couple of years, where the child, that, the victim, actually the victim of the right. bullying, in order to have it all stop, the family had to pull that child out right. of school. And I'm like, in what equation does that make any exactly. sense? If there's someone that continues to, you know, for lack of a better word, sort of menace, you know, uh, the school environment and or um, another student or multiple students and mm -hmm. or maybe even there's multiple family members or mm -hmm. parents are involved in this thing. At what point do we say, you know what, this, this, this is the problem and we need to remove the problem other than turning the entire school upside down right. in the process, I think, or at least the, how it's been working to date, it's, 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 it's been the victims are the ones that have right. to, yeah. in many instances, not only leave that school, they, they leave the school district, which is an absolute travesty, mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily deal with the problem, and then we learn that another school year starts, and it's the same kid, mm -hmm. and it's the same family, mm -hmm. and it's like, why aren't, we, why aren't we putting the brakes on that, and then if we need to do if, we're, if anyone's being rerouted, it shouldn't be the child that's there paying attention, playing by the rules, trying to get an education. It should be the one that's not and being disruptive and causing the problems. And it's, it seems like we're coddling and we're sort of allowing that behavior to continue to happen, mm -hmm. which then it ends up permeating the entire school to the fact that you, st you hear multiple yeah, people and parents and families leaving the school because that seems to be the trend. That has been a, tr that's been a, a, a big frustration over the last several years from parents that I've heard from across all neighborhoods is that they get totally frustrated, that they don't mm -hmm. think that they're being heard, and the problem continues to exist in the same child. We had one, I think, where someone almost tried to cut someone's ear off, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. in the same class a couple days later. It's like, right. where, where in any environment is mm -hmm. that acceptable? Right. We so talked about this at the last hearing, too, mm -hmm. about the safety transfer ends up mm -hmm. being the victim, not yeah, the right. one. Yeah. And I know we've worked closely on st certain students. Um, and if the bullying or the violence can't stop in the classroom or school, oftentimes it's the only option is to move the student, which in many times is more disruptive for that student. And there's not always that guarantee, because even if the anonymous hotline, many kids know, if all of a sudden one kid's not sitting in a classroom, and then a week later certain kids are being called out, I mean, kids are smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. and, and, the bull, and the mentality, obviously, of the bullier is to continue to put pressure on the victim because they know that it's going to be the victim that's arguably going to be the one that gets punished. So they kind of, it's almost like there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a game going on there where the bullier knows that nothing's going to happen to him or her. They're going to continue to, you know, pick on and bully that other student, and they know that the end result is going to be the student that's getting picked on is going to be the one that has to. I, I want to clarify that. So, so certainly every student has an option to move out of the school, and so we present that to, to not only to the to the student that's the target. We use the word target, and to the student that's the aggressor. If either of them wants to go, they have that. It's but they can't no, go to any school. Correct. If in it's a safety transfer. many times at that point, yeah, that's there right. are seats in performing schools. That's right. So we hear that concern. Well, they'll tell me I could go, but there's mm -hmm. only a seat that's right. at the Dever, which is underperforming, and there's the high... It, I'm just using that as an yes. example. But yeah. Yeah. absolutely, so mm -hmm. it's not always an option. Right. And that's why we see families leaving. There's not that exception like, okay, well, let them just get a seat at that school that's... The mm -hmm. choice of the parent. Mm -hmm. I know we've tried mm -hmm. to advocate for several students. One was a um, victim of the laptop bullying last mm -hmm. year, still having headaches and mm -hmm. not offering mm -hmm. a, a seat at a school that they would have done great at because it just wasn't a seat for them. But mm -hmm. we can always make right. a seat. I know as a teacher, we can always pull up a mm -hmm. chair in a classroom 
The union, we just yesterday um, or Tuesday approved their new contract, and as a former BTU teacher, I'm happy, but we can always add a chair. We can always make adjustments for those cases. And on, and on that note, with respect to school assignment, could we have a policy or could we give some consideration to, in, the, in, a, in an event where a child is, is bullied and it's determined that that's the case, to give them a preference uh, of, of another school? That's something that we of, can look of their into. Choice, we can talk about that for Because through no fault sure. of their own, mm -hmm. they've been forced out of their existing current learning environment. Mm -hmm. And then the choices are, if, if they're going to go into the school assignment pool, clearly they're not going to be able to get a school of their choice. It's almost right. like double punishment. Right. Like I, I want to get back to your point, your, your point about the, the aggressor not being penalized mm -hmm. or not receiving any sort of consequence. Yeah. And that is not the case. So I want to make sure that, that you are aware of progressive measures in terms of our code of conduct. And Dacia Campbell may speak about that. Dacia and I are the co-chairs of the BPS code of conduct team. Um, so a student who is um, a habitual, I think that was your word, a habitual offender, <coughs> over time, so we would start out with a prevention. I mean, we would start out with, it, with a tier two. So they would come, they would receive services, in addition to that, um, then, then they could be out of school suspended. If things continue over time, you know, we're going to provide wraparound services for that student, for the student that's the aggressor, because it's important that we're addressing the behavior of the aggressive student, because over time, those behaviors escalate and more problems occur. So we want, to, we want to try to provide services as much support as we can for the aggressor in addition to the target. And then finally, um, you know, if necessary, they would continue to progress through um, to, to additional consequences. And Dacia can speak a little bit about that. Good morning, Dacia Campbell. Good morning, um, I work in the Division of Schools. As Jody explained, I'm also the co-chair of the Code of Conduct Committee. And as she stated, it is twofold. Um, you know, when we're dealing with situations of bullying, we're also looking at the, con you know, what's going on with the, uh, of course, the, the victim and then the aggressor. And, you know, what we work with schools is we should be always implying, um, uh, always making sure that the code of conduct is applied. And the code of conduct is also, it also builds in this tier of, of, of uh, MTSS uh, tiered uh, support for we, su we support our students. Um, I just want to give some context in terms of suspensions. We do not suspend uh, kindergartners through second grade, right? And for grades three through five, there are a few reasons why you can suspend. And one of them is um, excessive bullying. And so it's, I understand the frustration about the uh, safety transfer policy, feeling like we're asking students who are victims to leave their school environment, but on the other hand, we are also dealing with the other student or supporting other students through the code of conduct. And we will use, um, in a, at the same time, sometimes we will support, but we will also discipline at the same time. It's two, it can be twofold. A student just does not need to be suspended out of school. A student can be suspended and sent to the Counseling Intervention Center for support. So there is some action in there uh, that has to take place. We're looking very closely at that. We're recording incidents in Aspen. What is the action that's being taken place to support the student? Is it restorative practices? Mm -hmm. is, it the, is it the counseling intervention center? Is it out of school suspension? Is it a long-term suspension? And in some situations, is it expulsion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. It will go on. I think what happens on one, on, on a several situations too, is that parents on either side just can't be shared the details involving right. in those incidences. Yep. And yep. sometimes that discussion comes my way and I'll take the time. Matter of fact, I was just thinking the last uh, week or so about some language in which we can use to share with parents that can um, illustrate that there is a code of discipline that is being um, followed in tiers and um, that could lead up to suspension or perhaps criminal charges. I think we're going to start using that language. That way, parents can feel like there is something being happening. And to your point, too, counsel, I just wanted to just express that in a lot of cases, you know, our victims are suspects and our suspects are victims. Mm -hmm. And so usually you have circumstances in which, you know, there's maybe mutual bullying um, mm -hmm. with, with incidences. Yep. So how do you, you know, be fair and equitable in, in that training. discipline? 
Yeah. And I knew as a special ed teacher in an inclusion school often, not often, but there are times when it's the special ed student who is doing the bullying, not mm -hmm. just the one right. being bullied. That's and right. so it definitely right. goes both ways. For and sure. you speak to your sexual assault cases. I mean, I think we've had several hearings even prior to this year. You know, we don't want to start categorizing six and seven year olds with you know, inappropriate touching as sexual assault. Mm -hmm. So to your point, um, Council Authority, mm -hmm. that's why they don't come to yeah. um, safety. And services. I appreciate you said that. You. Most mm -hmm. of my years were spent um, in kindergarten. Um, so mm -hmm. the kids, especially if they're failing, like they're in a safe environment, things happen. Kids have yeah, to make, watch it closely, but it doesn't need to be over reported, if not necessarily. Right. So a lot of what we're discussing is will be in the slideshow as we move forward. So I think if we could get back to the yeah. last few remaining slides yeah. and then we'll take more questions Perfect. so that the superintendent can answer those, okay? Um, so we talked about bias-based bullying. So reports of bullying, when they come into the, through the hotline or through Succeed Boston, if one of the questions is whether or not it is bias-based, if so, those reports are also forwarded to the Office of Equity, and we work in partnership with them, so there are two parallel investigations to determine next steps. Okay. okay. Um, so this is our, this is, oops, sorry about that. This is the Safe Space and Bullying Hotline. This is the information about it. Um, we're sharing it across multiple platforms, social media, so that students, families, and um, we've had clinicians call um, to just get some information as well. So you can report all of those mm -hmm. in, in all of those different ways and you can report that anonymously. I really want to emphasize that. Um, the other thing is um, that we have, we've, we're offering multiple ways that, that, uh, other, that people can call, so they call 311. I understand they're calling you. Um, and that we now have another reporting system in place, a helpline, and we are all working collaboratively together so that there is, um, to, to close any loops around reporting. Okay. Was that a recommendation from Desi? Because I know the, uh, that was a new role, someone was hired yes. last yes. school year. It was, yep. Okay. Yes, we've increased, in fact, one of the things we're looking is how to streamline the hotlines. Yeah. So rather than eventually having parents have to call all transportation, you know, how can we make this the simplest for parents, yep. simplest for students? Um, the other thing, Jody, I think it just would be important to share with the counselors is within the state, you know, the, there's been a lot of reworking around the anti-bullying laws. Yeah. And so what of our practice is modeling that? Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Sure. So, um, the BPS practice actually is exemplary. It's been categorized as exemplary, re, exemplary by the Council of Great City Schools. Um, so what, and we are in compliance with, with DESE in terms of their recommendations for a bullying prevention and intervention policy. So um, we have a multi-tiered approach so students can report, as I said, in multiple ways. We have, um, we have protocols in place and with Superintendent Skipper on board, we are holding schools and staff accountable for reporting and investigations and assuring that they um, are following our protocols around timelines. So our timelines are very tight, 48 hours before. Um, the school leader must notify the, the caller within 48 hours of receipt of the complaint and the school leader has five days to respond to that allegation. And the way that they respond to that includes, even if it is not a bullying allegation, a safety or support plan for the student who feels vulnerable. So, um, so uh, the superintendent has put a, a number of different measures in place for accountability and set the bar very high um, around that. And, and that is something very new and also very clear, just to your point, Councillor Flaherty, very clear that we are all responsible for reporting and following the protocols. We have systems in place and we are looking to purchase some new systems that will, to, to Superintendent Skipper's point, bring all those, those reporting mechanisms together so that it will be more streamlined. And then, uh, Superintendent, you had, and also had, uh, Chief um, 
probably right. There were a couple things that jumped out at the meeting the other day was the truancy piece. Yes. Uh, those numbers were staggering. Staggering. Um, and if you'd be kind enough maybe to share with my colleague as well as those here. Sure. And then in the police reform, uh, Chief, I think you've lost some personnel um, maybe due to retirement. And then we're sort of trying to figure out on the school police slash school safety side sort of how to fill <clears throat> some of those gaps. So I understand that you've got some challenges there and maybe you know, let us know how we can help as we're looking towards the forward thinking towards the next budget cycle. Um, but cool. also, I, I, I said a long time ago, I think that I find tremendous value in our street workers. And I know that the mayor is, they're trying to rework that or there's some, some tension points now over, over some things. And I would suggest that um, the possibility of maybe uh, if we can reimagine the street workers in some capacity, you know, I've always felt that if we could have a one male, one female street worker in our high schools at least, yeah. mm -hmm. they'd make a huge difference. They get mm -hmm. the raw intel. Kids are more apt to tell the street worker what the scoop is as opposed to telling the teacher or the principal. And so as we're sort of moving forward and as they're trying to figure out what to do with the, uh, with the street worker program and you're trying to figure out how to to, 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 yeah. to, to, to uptick your numbers around sort of the school safety uh, personnel um, as well as retirement, it's like l let us know if there's something we can do at our level through either a funding mechanism or just kind of connecting the dots here. But you know, you see, I think there's 25 or 30 street workers that are now arguably potentially in limbo as to what's going to happen to them. And and I know they add great value. They could be a good, maybe a good fit here. Maybe mm -hmm. uh, that's up for, for the superintendent and you you all to decide. But I'm just yeah. speak, thinking out loud here on that issue and also. Those truancy numbers in yeah. terms of kids just not going to school and right. So I really appreciate the um, the opportunity to talk about this, Councillor. Um, so so we have seen because of the pandemic just staggering amounts of chronic absenteeism and truancy. And I, I can't state it enough: our students are safest in our schools. Our students are safest in our schools. And this is really a community um, opportunity that when you see young people during the school day who are out there. Ask them why they're not in school, because they should be. Um, we saw this, this kind of a two-prong issue that's going on. So one is dropout, and uh, during the pandemic, so last year and this year, so it, it reports dropout figures report the year back, um, we have a, about 640, 50 dropouts from last year. Um, large concentration students, 17 to 22, 18 to 22. Uh, year before, it was much less, but again, that's because um, I don't think it was necessarily we had a lot less dropouts. It's that we were giving more leeway on coming to school because of COVID and the pandemic and the requirements. Um, but combined, we're talking, you know, 900 students. That's impactful in our city. The last time those numbers existed was when I first took on the, the uh, high school suit position, and I think we had about 800 dropouts. Um, the 18 to 22 concern me, and I, I talk about it everywhere, because they, they dropped out, they don't have the skills to succeed in a job, they don't have the skills to finish their degree yet, and they don't have a plan. And so this makes this all the more impactful for this group of young people. So we are actively working right now um, to re-establish programming that BPS had in place for, for decades that worked well for students who were off track to be able to help them get back on track and get the skills, academic, and job to succeed. And so we're in the process of doing that under Chief Kelton. And I'm going to actually ask Chief Kelton to come down um, to just talk a little bit about this. But linked to that is still this ongoing issue of chronic absenteeism. I think you heard the commissioner speak about it in the news as a statewide issue. Certainly our colleagues at the, great, at the Council of Great City Schools spoke about it. Um, you know, we had upwards of 40% chronic absenteeism. So when you actually think about that, of 180 school days, that's, that's like a month and a half of a student not being in school. How can a student possibly make progress? How can they possibly feel attached? Were they retained or mostly pushed along? Well, these are the students that might either fall under credit if they're at the high school. The more dangerous piece is if they're in the middle school yeah, they're and they're missing that much work, right? Or elementary, high school. elementary grades, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why we are about to launch a re-engagement campaign that we'll need the community support with. Um, and I, I started it every news I get to talk to. If you know an 18 or 22-year-old who's not enrolled in school, didn't finish 
do, you know, doesn't have a job, please have them contact our re-engagement center. And then the chronic absenteeism, which we need to, this is where we need to be on top of the data and the students, who's missing school, in what school, what's the plan that's in place to make sure those young people get reconnected mm -hmm. and they get their supports. I feel so strongly about this because my experience at middle and high school is that we have a one opportunity to keep these students in school and give them a life. And if we don't do it well and they leave us, they're always piecing it together. Mm -hmm. Chief Kelton, do you want to just talk a little bit about the re-engagement efforts um, and the uh, educational options build out and uh, what we're doing with chronic absenteeism? Sure. So I think, you know, especially after the pandemic, we have to do a better job of meeting students where they are and re-establishing that adult connection that was missing um, for the last two years. It wasn't consistent. And we know that young people need consistency. They need stability. But they also need us to know them and to know where they're coming from. So a lot of the work is relationship driven. I think this is also forcing us to re-examine our, our alternative education schools and what they're truly offering that is alternative and understanding that we need to meet students where they are so they get that sense of achievement. Um, and students don't stop coming to school because it's, you know, fun. They stop coming to school because they have lost that connection. That's right. And that's what we have to focus on, is reestablishing that connection. And that's going to take from the school side time and energy to speak to our parents, to connect with our community partners, um, to understand that the connections that we're going to make are not just going to be from school to student. It's going to include family, and it's also going to include people in the communities. We have so many people in the communities who have connections to our young people that we don't know about. So we have to do a better job of creating the space to really have those conversations around young people with our community partners so we can create wraparound holistic plans that don't just end when the student leaves our building, right? We understand that those connections have to continue into the community. And I think we have to do a better job of implementing those community connections within our alternative education schools. And you would say, I would say all schools also. Yes. I know many high all school, schools. Um, Izzy, who's like a great, um, you know, Izzy, uh, yep. football coach, many times he said, like, listen, you've got to go to math class. I'm going to be waiting for you on the football field. And I know many coaches across the city in arts. And it's another reason why we're advocating when it was, what, $72 of the um, budget only being spent on athletics and they didn't raise it. They used a little bit of ARPA funding to get it to $96. So next year I'm going to be... We will vote no yeah. this time yeah. until we can get more money for athletics and funding, knowing that that's a big piece connected to that connection. Absolutely. If it's not calculus class, maybe it's you know swimming after school that gets you through the yep. day and gets you those. Or maybe it's a job. For a lot of our young people, yep. they need to be making money. They yep. um, want to be you know, supporting however they can, their families, their friends, whatever it is. So we have to create those opportunities um, with our city partners where there's safe spaces for our young people to be and where they're wanted. Um, so that's a community conversation and the school is very much a part of the community. The jobs is big. We had the civic engagement day a couple weeks ago and I think like 10 high schools came with their um, IEP students, their special ed students, and four of them said, didn't they? Like, they're like, what do you need from us? They're like, we want a job. <laughs> what kind of jobs can you get us? I'm like, wait, there are jobs. And then Work Inc., which is, was here oh, yeah. in the organization. I'm like, there's so many great opportunities. So we all, I say it all the time, and I've heard my colleagues who have been here much longer than me say it that, we are such a rich city, we just have to do better at connecting our students, our neighbors, everyone to the resources we have. We have jobs and we have kids who want them, so we need to do a better job. Yeah, you can imagine if we, you know, in our city, if we had a youth passport for every student, then in the after school hours, the weekends, right, the summer, there's all kinds of opportunities they could use by just having that passport to go to museums, yeah. right, on the train. In, with programming. Yeah community-based organizations, open basketball for kids that want to just drop into a gym, going into a gym and actually having a membership, yeah. right, for students who might not qualify for athletics right now, right? I used to say when, when Tech Boston first went into Dorchester, it wasn't that we didn't have great athletes, we just didn't have athletes who, who, who actually had a GPA that could play. play. 
So we had to work toward that. Yep. But sure. we offering things for kids sure. that they can do in those after hours when right now we're competing with a street, right? So that's where we have to be able as a city to put our money, as a school district to put our money to offer and open that up in all communities of our, of our city. I just want to also add around the chronic absenteeism. Um, I think it's, it's difficult right now also, given all of the needs of our students, the social emotional needs, the need for stability and consistency for our support staff and teachers in schools, um, for the students that are showing up every day. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of interacting um, and getting to know students again. So I think what we're recognizing as a district that we have to um, sort of reinvent how we deal with chronic absenteeism and that looks like really forming, especially with our schools that have chronic absenteeism um, at a higher rate, establishing um, beyond our supervisors of attendance. Um, one of the schools uses attendance paras to actually go into the community, to knock on doors, to do that. Because our school-based staff can't do that during the day. So we recognize that's where we need to make an investment and where we need to really um, sort of amp up our efforts. This is where I give a shout out to my late mom. I had perfect attendance in grammar school and in high school, The whole, all of us, my brother and sister did. So uh, yeah, there was no, there was no uh, staying home uh, or ducking out. So, uh, of course, my brother and John and I made it up for missing classes at college, but uh, but perfect attendance uh, from from uh, kindergarten all the way up to uh, uh, to high school. Your kids and, uh, had it yeah. also, yeah. Yeah, and and Aaron actually taught my kids, so okay. it was sort of instilled in my kids. Never missed a day of school either. So, they like uh, school. Yeah. If you if, uh, if you're not in school, you can't learn, right? right? right. Oh, but I mean, to your point, Council Flaherty, like us thinking out of the box about the kinds of roles that, given the changes from the pandemic, we could embrace. And I think, you know, the street workers, I, I know as a principal, I relied heavily on the street workers that worked up in Tech Boston. Right. They had relationships with our kids that sometimes staff couldn't have, I know. right? And so I think finding ways between us and the city to be able to support programming like that and to Chief Kelton's point, think out of the box about what do we need? We need people that are in the community knocking on doors who are having conversations with students, with families. Right. You know, that student left because they don't feel attached. We need to be able to give them the opportunity and, and show them something that's gonna help them take a step. Right. So one, one just kind of really quick example, our re-engagement center that works with the private industry council, amazing work. Um, it, it, we had moved to a single point of entry. It's based uh, down on, out of Madison Park. And that relies on a student that's dropped out going to the re-engagement center. We also have a number of students in our schools that are very close to dropping out, right? Their, their, their chronic absenteeism is, is very high. We now have the re-engagement center coming to the schools, sitting and talking with the young people who already have one foot out the door. What's not working for you? What can work for you? So bringing the solutions to the kids is what we need to do, not putting another layer of responsibility on them to have to figure it out. That's great. And Superintendent, I know we, we have you for just a little longer, and I wanted to get to a little public 100%. testimony, and I know uh, Chief can make a comment. So if Pastor, if you could maybe make your way down to the, to the podium uh, so you can be heard. I know that we've got some folks, I see Bobby Jenkins has signed up to testify. We've got some folks on Zoom. So I just want to try to get in a little bit of the, the public testimony while we have you. Um, That's and, great. And Council Finn has a quick comment. Council President Finn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and apologize that I missed some of, some of the meeting. Um, and thank you again, Superintendent. We had a great visit recently to the Perry School in South Boston, so thank you for visiting with the students and with the teachers. Um, Superintendent, this might be off topic a little bit, but it's important to me, is the, the incredible role of the JROTC program in the schools. I have the opportunity to see the students at many different events across the city, including various parades, but I'm also familiar with the Excel program mm -hmm. and their JROTC program. There's probably not a more diverse group of students participating in a, in a, in a in a class or a, or a setting such as this. Um, but I'm, I'm al I always often hear that the BPS front office or the principals always want to cut the program out. 
And I was always discouraged by that, or that there was always discouragement from asking students to participate in the program or to stay in the program. But I know the importance of that program, mm -hmm. um, especially helping kids with leadership skills or communication skills, some, some discipline, but um, time management um, and, and other issues, giving back to the community. But do you have any idea of why this, this, there's this perception that BPS wants to cut the program and, mm. um, and you know, it's, it's discouraging to hear that. And is there a message that can be put out by BPS that the ROTC program is, is an important program? Yeah, so thank you, I appreciate that, uh, President. Um, I think I shared that day with you my, my personal experience at Tech Boston uh, where we had a really thriving JRTC program mm -hmm. uh, with the Army branch. And uh, we always saw it as, in, as a positive in a number of ways. One was uh, leadership, to your point, right? It was, it was teaching our young people about leadership, about being leaders um, inside the classroom, outside of the classroom. Uh, I also saw it as a, a way that our, some of our students found a cohort of students to be with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they weren't always the athletes, they weren't always the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the ones that would gravitate just to academics uh, or arts and music, but they found a group mm -hmm. that they could, had a common language with, that they um, developed a real relationship with. And I also saw just a lot of deep mentoring from the heads of the JRTC um, mm -hmm. throughout my time at Tech Boston. Um, I know that at different points, the branches uh, at the state level reduced. And so even when I was the uh, high school soup, um, we were faced with cutbacks um, from the central branches of the actual um, instructors. Uh, I would have to do some checking um, to see what the status is right now, whether those are continuing and they're continuing to consolidate. Um, they usually give the district a certain number of programs, and then we go through a process with the schools of identifying um, which fit and which schools would like them. I think the best practice is for the schools that have the thriving programs, and there are a number of our high schools that do, to share, to invite schools that might want to consider it to come over, to talk mm -hmm. to the students, to be able to see what they do and hear from the young people how life-changing it is. Um, so I'm more than happy, as I indicated, to kind of take that next step and talk with, the, with our high school program and our high school principals um, to see how we can get that kind of best practice getting shared. Well, thank you, Superintendent. And one thing that you mentioned that I, I definitely agree with, um, and I've noticed it, and it's so obvious, is these students that are part of the JROTC program, they want to be part of something. That's right. And right. you're right, they're, 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 they're probably not gifted athletes or, 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 or whatever, but they want to be part of a group that does some good work and, and helps each other out and maybe helps each other with their studies and academics, and, and it's, a, it's a great social, social program. But I've never seen a, um, a better program in BPS than the um, JROTC program. Just have a lot of respect for those kids. Mm -hmm. The hard work that they, they put in, they put on a uniform once, once a week, and oftentimes, unfortunately, kids make fun of them, mm -hmm. but they're still proud to put on a uniform and, and to participate and, and do the best they can. So I, I kind of um, admire those types of mm -hmm. kids for their resiliency. So just want to say thank you and want to encourage BPS to continue um, supporting that program. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Pastor David, uh, <clears throat> if you could just introduce yourself for the record in your organization, and you have the floor. Appreciate your patience, and I know that you attended the previous hearing, so yeah, yeah, we did yeah. get a piece of that presentation, but this is maybe an opportunity for the superintendent and her team uh, to hear your thoughts and based on your experiences, what you've been dealing with. Appreciate so welcome that. back. And again, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here and for holding this hearing and for all of you being present. Uh, so thank you, uh, everyone. Um, I'm a parent of uh, two graduates from Boston Public Schools and very proud of that, all the way through elementary, middle school, and high school. And, um, and very much a promoter and a supporter of our schools uh, across the city. I'm a pastor in East Boston, but at, 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 as a result of being involved in the, anti, uh, the Violence Reduction Task Force meeting that happens at the Ella Baker House every Wednesday, 
uh, hearing the stories and accounts of the concerns from people in the community, parents in the community, about school safety issues that were happening last fall, uh, we formed our group in January to try to bring some, a, a larger awareness uh, because we, what we recognized, or at least what I, uh, I and my colleagues felt, is that we would hear in isolated incidents and not aware of how this all connected up and how uh, deep some of these issues were running throughout the whole school system. And so we wanted to bring awareness, not as a criticism to our friends in the Boston Public Schools that, that again, I benefited from, my children benefited from, but to say, hey, there's serious concerns and we need to acknowledge those and be aware of those in order that we can work for solutions. And on the other side of that, we want to be part of the answer. We want to be part of the solution. I appreciate what I heard today from you, Superintendent, and your colleagues about your commitment to forging uh, school community partnerships and that being an important part of the work. And I just want to offer um, all of us in Boston SOS and our, our supporting organizations that are working with us to be part of that as well. So we're here uh, to be part of that solution. Uh, we have, and I want to recognize some of those organizations. I've already mentioned the Violence Reduction Task Force. I think there are 40-some social service agencies that, that are part of that meeting. Uh, it's been 30 years uh, that group has been meeting. Uh, and just by the way, just recently there was um, an interview uh, honoring the foundation of the Boston Ten Point Coalition, which did some amazing work back in the 90s, dealing with some of the same issues we're dealing with now that forged across the city in a time of crisis, m amazing partnerships, school, community, family, law enforcement, to address those in a holistic way. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the murder, murder rate uh, uh, for adolescents went from here to zero. Uh, so uh, the Boston miracle. Uh, so we need to maybe grab hold of some of the lessons that we were experiencing way back then. Uh, Promoting Violence Resol Resolution Incorporated. Renee Callender is the director of that organization. Project Right um, Incorporated. Uh, rebuild and improve Grove Hall together. Um, Mike Cuzo and others. SEIU Local 888, Tom McKeever. We've worked with these organizations. They've partnered with us. They've attended our meetings, been a part of our work. And so there's a large coalition of folks, I think, who, along with those that you've already connected with, who are interested and, and committed to, to be a part of the, the solution. I appreciate some of the response and, and even the, the kind of change in tone in terms of how, how the school is looking at bullying and uh, ad addressing that. So uh, thank you. Uh, for, for that response. I'm interested in a, in a couple of things that you mentioned. One is, is the, um, the anonymous call line. Is that a new development or has that been in place all along? It has been. Okay, okay. But maybe talk about um, the promotion of it. I think that... To your point, um, it's always been in place. I okay. think that we are really uh, promoting that much more. Okay. And um, we're understanding the impact that that um, students have in turn, or, or the impact that reporting has on students and families. And that's so we're really promoting that, yes. It's accessible to students and parents to access that number? It's accessible yes. to anyone. Okay. We, in fact, we get calls from all across the country, which okay. is kind of funny, but yeah. And I think, you know, the, the other thing, the other piece to that, Reverend, is that we can have the best policy in the world. <laughs> You know, um, you can have the best hotline, but if, if people don't, if, if people are not trained to use it, if they're not aware of it, and it's not being, it's not being expected and required to use it, then it's just a good policy, right? And that's not what we're after. We're after policies that are gonna change and make a difference to student safety, emotionally and physically. That's, that's the difference. Well, and I appreciate that comment. Thank you, Superintendent because that was going to be another point I was going to bring up, that, that the policies you're talking about, to some extent, were already in place. Policies were already on paper, but they weren't actually being implemented in the local school setting mm -hmm. to the extent that they ought have been. And not across, not in every school, but a, 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 a great number of schools, they weren't being implemented in a, in a, a good way. Boston Arts Academy being one example that's already been, uh, been mentioned. So I appreciate that, that comment, that, that it's always important to get the, the, the thing that's on paper implemented on the ground yeah. uh, in the school uh, in a holistic way. So I think that's helpful. Well, and so parents, and, and we found this last year, it was mentioned already, and so I'm curious to know, uh, as I kind of make a comment and then a question, when it came to bullying, parents trying to address it within the school, 
not getting, feeling a satisfactory response um, and doing it again and not, and then in some cases going to local, local a police station to say this is happening. Uh, the police coming to the school, the school not giving out any information to the, the law enforcement. So the parents stuck between a rock and a hard place. How do we advocate, help our child? My child's going to school and being bullied every day, having mental health issues, can't study, can't sleep. And I'm going to the school, I'm going to the community, and there's no resolve. There's no resolve. What is in place to help parents in that situation, maybe in a local school setting where it's not being dealt with? Is there a next step that they can take it to a supervisory kind of uh, person that could then uh, address that and help them, help the parent feel like, hey, something is happening? Uh, So we do have an escalation. We do have a policy in place. So go to the school leader. They're not satisfied with that response. They can call the hotline. We, we will follow up with them. We're very good at responding to that. Um, and then if, if the parent continues not to be satisfied with the response, it goes to the operational leader. And then from the operational leader, it goes to the assistant superintendent. Okay. It seems that parents don't have an awareness of all of these right. things. Right. Uh, they don't know about the anonymous call line. They don't know what the next step they can take within. They don't, it, maybe they don't have an advocate within uh, the school environment that's on their side right. and hearing their voice and, 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 and it sort of feels like oppositional. If I bring my concern, they're not listening or they think I'm not uh, being accurate or I'm just being a bother. Uh, and, and so it, it seems like that's maybe a gap or maybe there is something in place, again, that, that we're not aware of. But I think what's also happened, too, is we've changed our protocols. We've elaborated on our protocols. That's, that was kind of our next slide. Perfect. And just shows yeah. the escalation of reporting and what is mandatory to report on and the stages in which you have to go through. And, and not just to rely on the parents to have to report it, but we're, uh, we've had this presentation with our operational leaders and our school superintendents, our safety service staff, our student support staff, academics, so everybody's on the same page. And so the parents don't feel in isolation that they have to be the primary reporting source, but in fact we have a protocol for that, for those. I won't go through every, every, every category, but it's kind of clearly, we use it, we uh, model the same model as emergency management with the colors, very identifiable, you know, red, it's high level, you know, there's no wiggle room with that one. Mm-hmm. Then you have orange, there's some conversation that can happen between safety service and operational leaders, and we can push it up if we have to. Then there's, le- there's yellow, in which you can go to the operational leaders, and, that, um, and that, that communication happens. So then again, that it's not just all relied on parents in their communication. That's right, and I also think, Reverend, like what you're pointing out is on the communication side, each of these things requires communication campaigns, right? These are, how do we get to parents in a very simple way? It might even be a card, right? Like a small card they can keep in their wallet, Mm -hmm. but something that says, here's the steps I take, and if this doesn't work, then I can contact. Ultimately, if something's not resolved, that's when it goes to the, sorry, it's hard to talk into the mic. I know, I know. <laughs> um, but um, if, it, if it isn't resolved, then it goes, it, it actually gets reported at DESE, right? And it goes to the problem resolution the other direction. But we don't ever want that. We should be able to respond in an adequate amount of time that with a sense of urgency and give parents the information that they need to feel like they're being heard and that the issue is being addressed. That's, that's the bottom line of accountability. Mm. And Pat, and Pat, so that's, that's kind of how we sort of met because of that frustration in the, then. Yeah. So when the, parents, when the parents hit that wall, they reach out to their district or their at-large counselors and they're saying, can you help us here? And then we're, we're on the horn with the superintendent's office or the principal, him or herself, and trying to peel it back a little bit. And in some parts of it, it's the family may not like the results, right? That it's been dealt with at the school level and there's been some form of, whether it's discipline or, um, or uh, or um, uh, uh, restorative justice, et cetera, or, or it hasn't been. So we, we, it kind of cuts both ways. It was either, hey, it was addressed, and the parents just not happy with the, the result. That happens. But in many instances, it was that it was sort of just left in, in limbo, and, and the bullying or the, or, the, or the threats continued. So. Yeah. Councilor yeah. Flaherty, I just yeah. want to say that, that that is a big point of contention, and we try to educate families around that. Bullying is not the catch-all. 
So, so if it is not bullying, that doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to fix it, it. right? And, and so if we say it's not bullying, it's and this is what we're going to do to solve the problem. And, and if you could also echo that same language with families, because we still understand that there's a problem. And we differentiate between conflict and bullying because of the way that we deal with it. So bullying, we don't use mediation. We don't use restorative practices. Mm -hmm. But if it's a conflict, we can use restorative practices, and okay. we can do mediation. Yeah, and actually, um, we, are, we are in the process of building out a peer mediation program, which we don't have. And a lot of these conflicts can really be squashed very early on. Kids want them squashed. They don't want to feel tension with each other. Yeah. And so really developing out a mediation program um, you know, which builds capacity in every school. You end up having a peer mediator coach, and then you end up having students, older students, help to negotiate for younger students. It's such an important life skill, but you know, it, is, it has to be taught, it has to be developed. So this is something that we're taking on as an initiative this year, because I've seen it personally, we, we had it in Somerville, and I saw the key difference in de-escalation of student-on-student -student issues. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, as we kind of get excited about thinking out of the box about all these different types of things, um, you know, looking at uh, organizations and CBOs in the in the city that are doing negotiation, right, doing mediation, so that we can bring them in and have them work in different areas of the city. We've worked uh, recently, I'm sorry, with uh, SOARS, matter of fact, um, just with that in the schools and helping with mediation, helping at the bus, um, during the, the shutdown of the, the orange line and the green line, yeah. if you notice, we didn't have any major incidences yeah. at mm -hmm. the T's, and that was because of our partnership and collaboration, right. being there, being identifiable, yeah. working mm -hmm. with our community partners, and that's what we'd like to do even more with safety services. And so you talked about our numbers and mm -hmm. the challenge. I beg to differ a little bit because we haven't really had much of a challenge. We've been having a huge enthusiasm okay. for the model that we've created. I've yeah. interviewed like 35 awesome. individuals hoping to onboard about 10 um, uh, new staff within the next um, month or so. Um, so we're gonna continue that um, interview process. And again, as the superintendent and Jody mentioned, access is, is a key. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna make that, that information access and I'm gonna use my community partners in leverage to really um, support this model moving sure. forward. So talk about maybe where you are now and where you want to be with okay. your numbers. So right now, um, again, as a result of the police reform and losing the police title, um, uh, we did lose a number of individuals, um, significant numbers, like half of my numbers. Right. Um, That's just what I was really, to, I think, just, yeah, so we, was we, we spoke felt, about that. Feeling defeated, and then they. Yeah. No, no, they I think I think you know, just coming, I can wear my switch my hat now to the police hat. Yeah. You know, you know, once you're police, yeah. it's really tough. That's your career. Yeah. That's you know, you're you're, you're, blo you're blue, and I think that um, was kind of difficult to lose that. And it was difficult for all of us, I think. Um, but I think we made lemonade out of lemons and really looking at this city, being a city in which our, our former mayor goes to the labor secretary to have individuals be looking for jobs at a time just because of a decision that was made beyond unbeknownst to us. I think we um, put our minds together and really thought outside the box and said, we can build off of the model that was already sustainable without our police powers, but we're gonna focus on the good things, our partnerships, our collaborations, our mentorship, our familiarity, our support in, um, with, at dismissals, our, our support on safety teams, our mentorship within schools. So that's what we build off on. Um, and as a result, I'm hiring individuals throughout the city on all capacities that are familiar with that model and interested in working with us. So, I'd like to get the numbers back up. When I first um, took the role, I had 78 um, uh, officers. I'd like to get that model up. I think that'd be sufficient because, again, I want my staff to feel safe and secure in the buildings and strength in numbers. And so that's what we're looking at doing um, moving forward. That with training, that with hiring, and that with um, community engagement with our partners. We have a tremendous partnership with Girl Sleeps and Big Sisters. Matter of fact, they're having their fundraiser tonight and we're gonna be honoring the new um, CEO. Um, but those are the kind of out of the box thinking that um, I really am honored over here to be because we have that access to the community and really looking at that partnership in the community. And maybe just explain the number of BPD officers who work in our unit. 
So um, my former life as well as a BPD officer, I came from the school police unit. Matter of fact, my um, involvement in the community kind of illustrated that unit. Um, right now, they're having staffing challenges as well, I believe. I don't want to speak on their accord, but I know that they're um, menial numbers um, as far as where they used to be. So right now, they are a tremendous support to us still um, res responding to incidences like yep. this. So in these decisions that we make, whether it goes to BPD, whether it goes to the Code of Conduct, we do that in partnership with one another on a daily basis. Right. And we obviously very refreshing the other day to see almost like a renewed partnership to, to see our superintendent with our commission with our mayor that that hadn't happened in a long time, Chief. You know, Absolutely. I had a front row seat that, for whatever reason, there was tension locally Absolutely. or nationally that didn't need to be. It's you think about our offices, uh, many of whom chil whose children attend the Boston Public Schools, and they're our partners, uh, so they're picking up and dropping off, but they're also organizing the before and after school programs. They're coaches, they're mentors. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they need to be sort of part of the, the solution. And here. that design was designed to be ourselves. partnerships, right. you know, with awesome. really prevention and partnership. And so we'd really like to get Community back to that, yeah. to that support yeah. service. Yeah. That's right. And then Commissioner Cox and I, you know, are committed to, you know, each coming into the roles new, yep. you know, sure. hitting, hitting reset, being able to develop that relationship because we know the stronger that we work together for our young people and with all of our community-based organizations, the better the fabric and ecosystem for our students. I agree. And Pastor, anything additional before we get to additional public testimony? Uh, just a couple of things, just to follow up on that. Is there a memorandum of understanding between the school department and the police department? Because I think that was lacking. So the clarity in terms of how communication takes place. So there would be a reluctance to call 911 to include the police from school personnel because we're not clear. Uh, and, and that creating some really undue uh, safety issues um, and residual stuff that would happen as a result of not calling 911 and, and safety. Well, think, so, just wondering. Yeah. I think you. Uh, it just picks up, uh, Superintendent. Yeah. Oh, does it? Yeah. When I speak, okay, sorry. Um, difference between Somerville and Boston. <laughs> Ours is um, better. <laughs> um, so, I, I think as Neva will go through, or Chief Copley will go through, we, we are trying to be really clear with the field, right, as to what the protocol is given the circumstance. Um, the MOU is something that the chief and I are committed to work on, and so that, that in part is why we're beginning to meet. Mm -hmm. so, because it, in all of this, we need to make sure our schools are clear and our school leaders. You know, when you think of the number of individual decisions that school leaders need to make in a day, they have, to, they have to be trained and they have to have the information to make good informed decisions. So that's why there's such a push on communication, on clarity, on redefining protocol that you'll see from us. I mm -hmm. appreciate that. One of the one of the programs that was very has been very has a very successful history is Operation Homefront, mm -hmm. which is collaboration between the Boston uh, Police Department school unit, local clergy who would get a referral from the schools, a uh, middle school student who was truly struggling and would go do a home visit. Those were very powerful interventions, not to arrest anybody, but as a, a community intervention. And uh, again, those, the, the communication has sort of ended to some extent uh, on the school side of giving out those referrals. And it gets to that point about the connection between school and community partnerships that can be in a healthy way where uh, appropriate information can be shared and those, those things can happen. One final thing I would ask is, um, or, or, or comment on, and I love the idea of connecting youth to opportunities uh, around the city. Uh, I have a clergy partner in Revere, which is the next town over, of course, from where we are in East Boston, who said, you, you people in Boston are resource rich when it comes to youth things. And I got to thinking about it because oftentimes in my neighborhood, when something happens, we need more programming, we need more programming, we need more programming. And that's oftentimes our toggle switch. But then I thought about his comment and I thought, well, we, we do have, we have a great music program, we have athletic programs, we have, you know, all of this art programs. So what's happening, and I think what's happening is we have students that are not connected. And no matter how many times we say there are programs around, they still won't be connected. Mm -hmm. So we need, some, we need some folks who are gonna kind of shepherd them in. I, I appreciate the reference to the street workers, that kind of idea assigned in schools who could take a kid who is, and the family is disconnected, mom's working two jobs, whatever the situation, they're disconnected, who could, kind of take them by the hand and say, hey, I'm going to take you over and sign you up for the basketball league or the art program, and, and that there's that kind of 
community connection, sort of shepherding, if you will. Uh, another That's idea. Go on. We um, found that out during the budget season when we were talking about adding more youth summer jobs, and we realized more than half of our youth summer jobs weren't filled. We didn't need more. We needed to make sure we were connecting kids in different neighborhoods for different ways so that thinking outside the box. How are we going to let kids know, like, you can work at, you know, yeah. the music studio, Zoomies over in East Boston, or you're at Humanity for the um, Artists over in South Boston, the great programs that just sit empty. And then there's kids that we bump into who say, or parents, I wish my son, daughter had a summer job. And I'm like, well, there's summer jobs out there. Let's get, you know, and oftentimes it's too late in the season, so mm -hmm. we have to be proactive. Right. And as Councilor Murphy knows, this is, you know, this is an issue in schools too, which is making sure that you know every single child. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, the children that you don't know can't get connected to the resource. You know, it's why we believe in a hub model, in a community schools model. And I just wanted to say that um, I wanted to give a shout out to my parish priest, Doc Conway, because he was one of the pioneers working on Operation Homefront. He asks me regularly, when are you doing Operation Homefront? <laughs> like, he'll come by the house, when are you doing Operation Homefront? I'm like, so anyways, it was funny that you brought that one up. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Well, thank That's you very good. much. Thank you. Thank you so much for all you do. So we have some uh, Erica Kuka from the Boston Teachers Union. If you'd like to come down and offer testimony, uh, they'll be followed by uh, George Lee uh, from Youth Justice and Power Union. If you wish and choose to, you may testify here. I also see Robert Jenkins. Uh, Robert, if you want to come down to the podium and you get uh, two minutes to offer public testimony, then we're going to shift. After that, we're going to shift to Zoom. We've got some folks that have been patiently waiting on Zoom. That. Central staff will start to get teed up for. So, Robert Jenkins, welcome to the chamber. Good, Good to see you. Good afternoon, Councilors. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Murphy. We spent a lot of time this summer out in the hot sun. I was officiating one of my things I do for BPS and for the community. I want to thank everybody here. Uh, I was part of the Boston Miracle. At the time, I was a staff assistant and then went on to Parks and Recreation as a regional uh, specialist under the Flint administration and worked under the late Tom Menino. So I'm very well aware. Uh, superintendent, saw you last night, <laughs> and I sent in my uh, testimony. But it's most importantly, I said last night, one band, one sound. We have to follow this. And the reason why the Boston Miracle worked was because we had everybody. We had the police. We had Billy Stewart, who is football scheduler for, you know, for, um, for the high school football, which I'll be back on the field this Friday after a month off. But probation officers, street workers, uh, police, community-based organizations, the clergymen, they went out on Friday night to make sure kids were, you know, there where they had to be, and they did a phenomenal job. And you got to remember, it was before cell phones. It was for monitoring systems. It was the village taking care of the village. And right now, we have, because of the pandemic, we have kids, families who are traumatized. We are uh, programming. I'm a community engagement advisory council member from the district, been there since uh, its inception. I'm president of the Madison Park Alumni Association, class of 1978. All right, uh, also, I'm a school site a uh, council member as a partner at Madison for the last 10 years. So what I'm saying is BPS and the Boston Police Department can't do it by themselves. We need the Boston Public Health Commission. They have peer, inter, uh, they have peer leadership groups for teens. They have a tons of programs for families. We have our own mechanisms. That's what we did. We brought city, um, uh, Boston Centers for Youth and Families. It's another key agent. For the last two years, they pulled out of Madison Park. Once the kids leave Madison Park after sports, if they're not involved in sports, that entire building is open. It pains me when I go do a JV football game or a Friday night football game at Madison Park, all right? That facility is closed. We talk about summer jobs. We don't have lifeguards. No lifeguards. We can, be, we can train lifeguards and they can have an all year round job. Right there at Madison. Madison has the biggest pool in the city of Boston. That's been closed down the last two years. When we talk about facilities, BPS is their building, but they can't manage, manage it because after hours. That's where you bring in your community partners, the YMCA, 
the uh, Boys and Girls Club, Teen Empowerment. These are a lot of groups that were back around the day. You know, uh, you know the clergyman, Superintendent Skipper knows I'm going to work with her, her team. I know all the numbers. You know, I even know all the city hall numbers. Trust me, I memorized them. I even know in there, you know, 3050 or 3150. I know those numbers because I used to be there. But most importantly, is getting back to the basics. Uh, programs that BPS need to work with is the Part One and cheerleading programs. They have all of them have over 350 plus kids. A lot of those kids are BPS kids, and those kids have to maintain a grade average to even play because Pop want to oversees that. Right. It's unfortunate our athletic program will get better. You know, it definitely will get better. I know it will under, you know, Superintendent Skipper and her staff. That has to get better because kids, we got to bring these kids in. You know, they're out there. And, you know, like I said, I'm out there all the time. I'm a BNBL official. I know a lot of these kids since they were six years old, and I've been doing it being BL for over 30 years. So I've run now into grandparents and parents. I said, you're still out here? I said, yeah, I'm still out here. You know, but it's just one of those things that we have to do it. Uh, in closing, one thing I would like to say is that um, it's a total effort, but something I did not hear today. The first line of communication in BPS is the teacher, student, family. Mm -hmm. We have to, we have to engage our parents and let them know that they're already on a school parent council, whatever school their kid goes to. We have to build the school site councils. We have to. And I, you know, uh, the helpline that the superintendent has, they have to know the um, chain of command. Because if you go to that helpline, well, how is the, you know, teacher and the principal going to feel, wait a minute, you didn't even come to me which is the first line of communication that we have to shore up. We have to look at programs such as I've had the, <laughs> I've had the best opportunities because I've you know, worked in schools, but one of the one of, uh, program that we need to look at for after schooling is the Rafael Hernandez, and I see Ms. Tavares right there. She was the principal there. She remembers me. I was there with the fourth graders. Uh, you look at those programs. It's enrichment programs. We got to get the colleges involved. And I'm going to bring something up that nobody wants to talk about anymore. Pilot taxes. If the colleges, local colleges paid their money, that's over two to $600 million that we can have in revenue that could do these programs. That can work. Trust me, it could work very well. But again, getting them involved. I mean, you know, I opened up a can of worms. I don't care. But it has to be opened up, and that has to be brought up. So, Superintendent, you know, I'll be calling you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll brother. be in touch. Thank you all. Good to see you. I appreciate Thank you. it. And uh, any other, any, I see Naomi um, Hastings, you can um, take to the podium. Anyone else here wishing to offer public testimony, just uh, queue up right over here next to where uh, Bobby spoke. So, uh, the gentleman, you, uh, you have the floor. Just please state your name and any affiliation for the record. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Can we, good morning, still. <laughs> uh, my name is George Lee. I'm a youth worker and organizer at Youth Justice and Power Union. And just want to speak um, some, to share some comments that um, young people in our group have talked about, especially in terms of addressing the root causes of some of the situations that we're talking about here today. And it's similar to some of the themes that I heard um, y'all bring up around the importance of relationships with students, um, the, the need to provide support and counseling, figuring out ways to de-escalate student on student issues. Um, and so, so uh, this week folks, talked with each other and shared what they saw going on in schools, what would keep them safe, um, and really emphasizing addressing the, the root causes. Um, they were disappointed not to be able to be here today because this is during the school day, and our hope is that if there are future hearings on whether it's schools, public safety, youth jobs, et cetera, that they can be at times where students come, can come as well as family members, community members um, who are working jobs, teachers, and so forth. Um, but here, some of, the, some of the things they wrote up, which I'll try to, to read out. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so they talked about having um, mandated more, like mandated, sorry, mandated um, th that, that they felt there was too few mental health resources for students and really increasing that. Having more restorative justice, having staff who can really connect with the students 
figuring out what issues can be fixed at the school if possible, and a lot of times being able to be addressed by students themselves or with students and staff support, um, knowing and being cautious of when bringing in parents could actually escalate the situation worse. Recognizing racism, and folks talked about ways that they felt that staff um, were racist in how they treated folks um, in discipline. Um, worrying that actually increasing police activities will lead to students being viewed as criminals and then them starting to fit that pattern. Um, so really reversing that. Having mentors who genuinely care and having specialized teams for drug-related incidents. Um, some folks shared some pretty sad stories of folks they, they, they know who are struggling with drugs and addiction, um, but really figuring out how to get support for those students. Having more mental health professionals, and this um, relates to the relationships above, but really having people who care. So those were some of the, the main um, suggestions they had. Thank you. And I think some questions that have come to mind are just how do we get a sense of the actual specifics of what resources are there? Like, what is the ratio of guidance counselors to students now? And how do we strengthen that and put more funding? How much money is actually being used right now to fund youth leaders in schools, counselors, mental health support? The other thing I want to speak on is the, what folks talked on today, the connection between inside of school and outside of school and the opportunities that are needed because a lot of times stuff that's happening in schools is also a result of struggles that students are facing outside of schools, um, and sp especially around jobs and programming. Um, I respectfully disagree that there's actually enough jobs right now, just having heard, and it came up here, the number of folks who are asking for jobs and having seen young people try to reply, apply repeatedly. And I would say that actually, you know, SuccessLink used to hire 5,500 young people, and now it's only 3,300. I think there's problems with how the sign-up process works and the outreach from the organization and the staffing, like the need for more staffing there to be able to get more positions. But in terms of um, BPS's role, um, and the comments before, I don't see um, if, if they're still around, but in terms of, for example, having more lifeguards, um, I actually don't know, but does BPS directly hire students and does it do it through SuccessLink or could it actually you know, add hundreds or thousands of jobs through BPS during the school year and the summer. Um, but also, are there ways BPS can help with people signing up for jobs? So the, a lot of young people find the process for signing up through SuccessLink very cumbersome, but could BPS actually just have automatic enrollment for every student because you have so much access to a lot of their information? Could there be a day set aside in classes all across the district where everyone from 14 to 19 and up can sign up in class on the spot? Um, and that goes to what y'all are saying, like not putting another layer of responsibility for students to have to jump through hoop after hoop. Um, we talked about that hub model, really being able to bring those resources in school together. Um, and we'd welcome to a chance to meet with you, Superintendent, and um, your, your team with our groups to figure out ways to help make that school youth connection better, to get those resources to folks outside of schools and also to strengthen the supports for students inside of schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank and then you. we have, is it Erica? Sorry, one last thing, just because the question about the MLU came up. I know there's, um, there's been a push from community groups who've been really working hard on trying to figure out ways to de-escalate situations in schools and provide supports instead of over-criminalizing over students um, to have more of a community process around how that MOU between BPD and BPS comes up. So I know you said you all are thinking about that, but if we can find ways to engage the community in that process as well. Thank you very much. Naomi, you have the floor. State your name and any affiliation. Hi, Naomi Hastings. I'm a District 1 resident. Um, I actually pulled my daughter from BPS because of how things were, but I do have a toddler who will be starting BPS, and I'm hoping things will be better by the time she gets there. Um, I just wanted to speak to some of the violence that's been happening. Um, it's been a really bad week in the city. Uh, well, past like month actually, we've had like babies, like kids my daughter's age, killing each other in broad daylight. Um, yesterday, kids in Eastie, I'm not sure whether it was Eastie High or Excel because they wear the same colors, but um, robbed one of their classmates by gunpoint in Maverick Square. Um, then my friend and coworker, her son was truant from school on Monday, and instead of getting a call, like we used to, if I skipped school, my parents would get a call saying we weren't there. She got a call saying her son was arrested with his friends. 
found with guns and ARs. That's so scary. Our kid could have died that day. These kids, they, I feel like this generation, they feel like they're living in Grand Theft Auto. They have no value of life. The concept of village is gone. I'm 34 years old, and I can tell you, like, my daughter will be, if she wants to go somewhere, I, I, okay, well, who are you going with? I want to talk to their parents. There's a big disconnect. People don't want to talk anymore. Like, someone's coming over to my house. What, they don't want to meet me. They don't want to know who I am. They're just, like, that scares me. You know what I mean? Because it wasn't that way growing up. And there's a real disconnect now, and I just think we like, all need to get on the same page. And like, everyone has brought so many awesome, valid points about like, and it's funny he said that, because I always use that line um, from the movie, one band, one sound. It does need to be the whole community. We really need it to be a village again. We're so disconnected, especially the past year, two years of pandemic. There has been nothing but division in this city drawn by political or uh, your vaccination status. There's just nothing but division. And it's not productive at all. Um, so, hold on, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> but basically, um, we need more resources. Like you said, the resources are there, but it's connecting them. My own experience this summer, um, trying to get my teenage daughter a job, I used to be very tech savvy, I'm not, so like you spoke to that. The technology is there, but everyone might not know how to use it. Uh, so, and then like you guys also said, having it not be on the student, because like my daughter has an IEP, I probably should have had an IEP, so like the two of, I was just grateful I had a friend in the North End who ended up giving her a job, because the process for applying through BPS, it was like too much. Um, but yes, we, these kids need jobs, they need resources, and then I get that you know people view things differently, but as a black mother, I can tell you, like I do want police in the school. I do want metal detectors, because these kids think they're, like I said, living in Grand Theft Auto, have no value for life, have no respect for adults anymore. It's nothing for a 14-year-old to pull out a gun and shoot someone. Like People, we need to wake up. This is like, I have never seen it as bad. Obviously, like, born rainy year, there's been violence, but like, I don't know, something about the past, like, two weeks has really triggered me. And these kids are hurting. The past two years of isolation, uh, not in school, I think, if that's one thing we take away from the pandemic, is that these children should have never been taken out of school. Lowest risk population, no risk to these children. They should have never been taken out of school. Because let me tell you, some people, their home life is, it, like school is the safe place. So the trauma that we are going to be seeing for years to come, we're already starting to see it. We're already starting to see it. You've got 14 year olds killing each other in the street in broad daylight. These kids, like we need more mental health services. We need like wraparound services for families too. Like I said, I, I wanna see a village again. I don't want to like not know who my friend's parents are. If we could do things to connect families and parents, like, because there is just so much disconnect, you know, and I just want to see a change. That's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Naomi, you. for your testimony. Know that uh, next time, obviously, you can call Council Murphy or I, you can call your district city council, we can plug him into the Hope Line. And I, I do want to give you guys props real quick. Thank you, um, Naomi, you call I us. Called Monday, yeah, I appreciate um, you. I called Monday when my friend came to me. We're uh, both single mothers, local um, 328 carpenters, and um, good mother, great mother, doesn't want to lose her son to the streets. So I started calling everyone. I started calling my contacts on the police department. I started called Aaron Murphy's office. I called Frank Baker's office because we weren't sure which district she lived in. So I just want to say thank you to you, no, to David, you to Lisa, and then from Frank Baker's office, I think his name, John or Josh Micker. Sure. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. An Irish last name. But Make thank you for your help um, because now that mother is getting the services she needs and hopefully we are going to save her son from the streets because, you know, these kids, they don't, they, I'm telling you, they don't even, he has court in a month and it's like, but he, he doesn't actually like realize the volume and the gravity of how mm -hmm. serious this is. Mm -hmm. It's true. So. Thank you. Thank you. So Appreciate it. 
Welcome. Please state your name and affiliation for the record, and you have the floor. Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Kuka. I'm one of the organizers at the Boston Teachers Union office. I'm also a BTU member. I was an inclusion uh, teacher in elementary schools across the city. Um, and even though I deeply believe in a lot of um, our policies, like the Learn Without Fear policy, I never worked in middle school or high school. I don't have firsthand experience working with school safety officers, so I know that I'm not among the best of our members to be testifying here today. Um, I'm just here because of the timing of this meeting and the fact that the people that are most affected can't be here to speak for themselves, so I'm here. I'm hoping I can do my best to speak on their behalf, and I'm hoping that moving forward, these meetings will be held at a time when educators and students can um, testify for themselves. I. Um, as an elementary teacher, have been in a lot of the situations that you spoke to in terms of working with students with emotional impairment labels, working with students who have brought weapons to school, to, you know, being the person to separate students in the middle of fights. And as a BTU staff member, I've also visited schools in support in the wake of these like, you know, instances of violence. And um, I know that Superintendent Skipper, you referenced the need for our school communities to have healing and to have support, and I 100% agree with that. I agree with a lot of what's been shared. I don't want to repeat, but I echo a lot of what George shared as well. And um, what we know is that the carceral solutions don't have a positive impact on our school communities. Um, when we talk about the right to feel safe and welcome and thrive as you shared, um, that doesn't come from increased police officer presence. That comes from deep investment in counseling opportunities. And that comes from applying restorative practices with fidelity, not just in the aftermath of these events, but actually like wrapping them around full surface. Um, and so over the course of the pandemic, I know that the district had a huge uptick in the hiring of mental health professionals and committed to maintaining those levels in our recent tentative agreement. And I think that really, like, that's one of the areas where we need to be putting a lot of our resources in is to making sure that our educators in the classroom actually know, like, these are, these are practices that we should be using from the beginning of the year, not just when something happens, not in the aftermath of an instance, but how do we build that community and ensure that students are like building up those skills from the beginning. How, how do we make sure that we're building up those relationships, that we're getting to know those students? A lot of the things that you already said of like, you know, knowing what, what students need, what their interests are. Um, folks mentioned the opportunities that exist in terms of student jobs and the fact that we can't connect students with those if we don't actually have the time and the resources to have those conversations, to get to know them, to get to know their families. Um, I know the person who spoke first mentioned a program where like, clergy and police officers were visiting families. I was really lucky enough to work at schools where we were given that time and we were paid for that time as educators to go and visit families and get to know what they wanted for their students, get to know what their students' interests were. And so the more that we can create those opportunities for our educators and for our schools, the the better that we can you know, support our students and build that sense of community and that sense of safety and that sense of warmth that we really need to thrive and move forward. And that's all I wanted to share today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Erica. And uh, Superintendent, I know you have a hard stop, so um, you are obviously uh, free to go at your convenience. I know we have some Zoom testimony that just encourage you and your team to maybe review it at another point before we shift to Zoom. But cannot thank you enough uh, Great. for I, your I can't thank you both. I mean, this is, it's, to me, this is just, it's renewal. And it, to me, it's just, it's very powerful to hear those in the audience giving testimony mm -hmm. and just asking for us to be one city yep. and recognizing for our young people, which is the most important thing we do, we each have a role. So I really appreciate the council's support. I appreciate this floor to be able to share, you know, and to hear a lot of the recommendations and we'll take those back and um, hopefully we'll have another not too long. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Great. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, you, Superintendent. Uh, thank you, Chief uh, Neva Coakley Grice, and also Senior Director Jody Elgi. Appreciate in the entire team, obviously that you brought. Um, you know, I know you're committed to this issue. We're committed to partnering with you. Obviously, it'd be in the ideal scenario. Would love the number to be zero, zero instance of violence, zero bullying, zero, zero, zero. The reality is that this is what we're dealing with. But if we're working together, committed. We can make a difference, uh, so I appreciate your time and attention. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, if we can shift to the Zoom testimony. And who's controlling Zoom? You? All right. Thank you, Superintendent. See you, Chief.
Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Is this Elizabeth? This is Aaron. Aaron Stewart, Citizens for Juvenile Justice. Welcome to the Boston City Council hearing. If you could just state your name and affiliation just for the record and you have the floor, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. My name is Aaron Stewart and I'm delivering this testimony on behalf of Citizens for Juvenile Justice or CFJJ. CFJJ is the only independent nonprofit statewide organization working to reform the juvenile justice system and other youth serving systems in Massachusetts. Any action taken today should comport with revisions in state law adopted in Chapter 253, Section 78 of the Acts of 2020, which expanded student privacy protections for students across the Commonwealth. This section of our general laws clearly states that school department personnel shall not disclose to law enforcement any information relating to a student or student's family. A major driver of this state law was the experience of students in Boston, students who faced consequences when school officials and school police shared their information with law enforcement. There are already exemptions in state law that allow schools to share information to address serious behavior and to maintain a safe school climate. Mass General Laws Chapter 71, Section 37L allows for the disclosure of student information when it is germane to a specific unlawful incident or to a specific prospect of unlawful activity the school is otherwise required to report. Across the country, different jurisdictions have implemented alternative approaches that improve school climate and address school safety from a lens of prevention. For example, Oakland, California eliminated, eliminated their school police department on June 24, 2020. Since, Oakland has instituted an alternative safety plan, sending social workers or psychologists rather than a police officer to work with a student who is experiencing a mental health crisis. The most impressive example is arguably Los Angeles, which approved a plan in February 2021 to shift $25 million in funding previously allocated for school police into a $36.5 million initiative called the Black Student Achievement Plan whose mission was to support the mental and academic well-being of Black students in the nation's second largest school district. Under this plan, the district added 221 psychiatric school workers, counselors, climate coaches, and restorative justice advisors to schools. We urge this council and city leadership to follow the lead of these cities in committing additional resources to addressing student mental and behavioral health including models to address student misbehavior in a holistic and developmentally appropriate manner and to adhere to the law of the Commonwealth in protecting the privacy of students. Thank you for having me today and I'm here to answer questions if needed. Thank you, Thank you Aaron uh, from Citizens for Juvenile Justice for um, your testimony. Uh, obviously I know that some of the cities that um, Aaron had mentioned are uh, upside down and they don't have our community policing model. So I, I want to just give a shout out to the partnerships in, in our city. Some of our, some of Boston's greatest success stories are a direct result of just our partnerships. Uh, we've got a wealth of resources, and and so uh, recognizing clearly and adhering to you know, mass general laws is, is paramount, but also making sure that uh, we're partnering because a lot of our police officers' children go to the Boston public schools, and their before and after school programs, and they're mentoring. Uh, they're in the community. They're working. Uh, uh, making sure kids are, uh, you know, uh, plugged into sports programs, art programs, uh, job programs. So it's a partnership, um, you know, on all fronts. And we all have a responsibility to make sure that our schools are safe and that obviously our children are in safe learning environments and that they're learning and they're being and they're, and they're succeeding. Uh, and uh, and so that's, I think, the goal here. So but I appreciate obviously the perspective of of uh, your perspective and the perspective of the organization and, and obviously I trust that the superintendent uh, is working with and, and BPS working with the confines of of, um, of the master and laws. So, but I appreciate that, and thank you for your involvement today. Thank you, Sabrina Barroso, student immigrant movement. Sabrina, if you're with us, if you could just please introduce yourself and affiliation for the record, and you have the floor, Sabrina Barroso. Hello, everyone. Hey, Sabrina, Can you hear me? You? Welcome. Yep. Good morning. 
We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yes, good afternoon, city councilors and all community members. I first of all wanna give a very big thank you to everyone who has shared testimony, um, also the superintendent and those who were with her, um, like Chief Neva Coakley, um, and I'm forgetting the other person's name, but I, I really wanna express a lot of gratitude for everyone who has shared their concerns, as well as like BPS for um, being able to provide so much information today um, that was new to me. Uh, and so like to introduce myself, my name is Sabrina Barroso. I'm a community organizer uh, with, this, with Stories Inspiring Movements, which is formerly known as the Student Immigrant Movement. Um, just for some context, SIM is an immigrant youth-led organization here in Massachusetts. We're mainly based out of Boston. And many of, people in our, of the people in our leadership and our membership are young people who were a part of Boston Public Schools or are currently a part of Boston Public Schools. Um, they're not here today because they're at school. Uh, I'm at school, I'm at Bunker Hill right now, so hello everyone. Um, and yes, so I'm here sharing a bit of the concerns that um, Sim wanted to share for this hearing. So we wanted to highlight that we too are concerned for um, the well-being of our community. Like folks have mentioned, um, the pandemic and even prior to the pandemic, there have been many concerns for young people and families um, from a range of different things that have been impacting our lives and our well-being. I work closely with students and families here in Boston, and, and I have actually been a part of many meetings with um, the BPS administration prior to the pandemic to address the protocols regarding incidents and the rights of students and families. Um, this has been an issue for our communities, like we're saying, for many years, and this actually is not so new. Um, I was actually very optimistic to hear the uh, commitments that BPS has made to support students, um, particularly highlighting the importance of social emotional learning, as well as centering restorative relational practices um, that are responsible and as the superintendent said, life-changing um, in an approach for our schools to implement. Um, just briefly, I wanna provide some of the recommendations that our membership and leadership have provided for me to share with you all today. One of which is something that um, many other community members actually expressed, as well as city councilors, um, the need for there to be um, some more public knowledge about the protocols and that BPS uses to address and manage school incidents. This has been something that has been very important for him, um, provided the context that we have been working on this issue for a few years alongside other community members and organizations and young people. We know the impacts of um, how school incidents can be handled and how that impacts our people. So, you know, even just knowledge itself is a huge uh, way to empower our families who are experiencing situations um, like this in the schools so that they can best know how to advocate for themselves alongside the school's response. I also want to highlight the point that George made um, what about the MOU with BPD. I think it's very important for the community to um, inform and be a part of the process for creating this MOU as there's a large history of neg negligent use of information um, about students and their families. And so this is gonna be very important for um, the continuation of, of moving forward. I also wanna highlight um, other requests that members brought up, which were similar to the ones of uh, YJP uh, Youth Power Justice Union, which was also access to mental health resources for students at their schools, counselors and social workers that could work in de-escalating and um, managing situations at their schools, as well as um, having uh, more representation for their parents, especially those who don't speak English or are not considered or not typically engaged um, to be a part of the school community. Um, and so that's the testimony that I wanted to share today. Again, I wanna express my gratitude for being able to share with you all the recommendations from our leadership and our members. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Well said and, uh, and good luck with school and see all the activity in the background. So, but I appreciate you taking time to join us and to share your thoughts and your experiences with respect to BPS and dealing with this very important critical public safety issue. So best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Central staff, if you can allow Donna Bowen. Donna Bowen, I think, is in the queue. And that will be followed by Jordan Ahmed, and I think that will conclude uh, public testimony via Zoom, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Donna. I, 
Good afternoon, Donna. Can you hear us? Good afternoon, Donna. Can you hear us? Last call for Donna Bowen. Donna Bowen, can you hear us? Maybe we'll shift to Jordan Ahmed. Is Jordan Ahmed still with us? Hi there, can you hear me? Good, good yes, uh, Jordan, good afternoon, City Council at Large, Michael Flaherty. Uh, Jordan, just please state your name and affiliation, if any, for the record, and you have the floor to share your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jordan Ahmed. I'm a community organizer at Muslim Justice League, serving the greater Boston area, and I'm also a former special education paraprofessional in the neighboring Cambridge Public Schools. Um, I really appreciate the concerns that inform this hearing, and I just wanted to briefly add some of my concerns about any increased data sharing or surveillance of Boston students. I think we've made a lot of progress to protect students to address the inappropriate use of private student information and the unjust creation of criminal reports about young people, especially with the recent ordinance on surveillance oversight. Um, it is BPS's responsibility to continue to be clear about the purpose and consequences of incident reports to be transparent and inform students and families before any of their information is shared with BPD and to continue to train staff and administration on these protocols. Overall, it's important that we continue to focus on restorative justice and investing in counselors and mental health services rather than increased police presence or community policing like a lot of, our, um, a lot of my colleagues have said previously. Um, it's vital to our community and to our students that we don't subject black and brown students in particular to increased criminalization, surveillance, or discriminatory disciplinary consequences and that we instead invest in their mental health and opportunities. Um, I also just wanted to reiterate what folks have shared before me about the accessibility of a hearing like this to students, teachers, and families. It's frustrating that this was held at a time when students and teacher partners that I organize with can't participate because they are at school. Um, I look forward to hearings like these doing a better job of incorporating their voices, but that's all I really have to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, obviously for, for your testimony and um... This obviously hopefully will be the first of, of many hearings. Clearly, uh, you know, there's an issue uh, uh, with respect to public safety and bullying in our Boston public schools as evidence, but some of the most recent numbers, just this school year alone, there are already 145 allegations of, uh, of sexual misconduct, and there's already, I believe, 165 reported incidents of bullying. So this is clearly the first uh, of several hearings. Uh, we will say that in order to schedule, we really needed to hear from the superintendent, and so this was really scheduled around our superintendent's schedule. Uh, she's just getting started. Her schedule uh, is extremely busy. And so um, if you notice from the hearings, we had had a couple dates that had to be rescheduled uh, because we felt it was important to hear from the school leader to see you know, what her policy and positions are moving forward. There was a huge disconnect over the last several years uh, with respect to the reporting of incidents uh, and parents um, getting their issues redressed. And you can even see from a diversity of opinion that today's hearing, um, you know, some of the most compelling testimony were from parents whose children are in the schools. They're actually attending, so there are consumers, and their children have been bullied or, uh, or threatened or, in worst cases, either assaulted or sexually assaulted. So we really wanted to sort of put a premium on how we can address those issues from one, recognizing it, and two, try to solve it. So. But I hear you, uh, our hope is obviously to have another hearing uh, where we could, uh, you know, uh, to you know, borrow the expression, uh, to meet people where they're at, but um, to try to maybe have a, a, a couple of different time frames. Maybe we can have something later in the afternoon. Maybe we can have something in the evening as well. So we're, we're willing to accommodate uh, that request. And I appreciate, obviously, uh, you taking time and staying with us for the entire uh, hearing to be heard. So thank appreciate you. that. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, anyone else on Zoom, if we can maybe double check with Donna Bowen. Is Donna still with us? Also, if there's anyone else here in chamber who wishes to offer uh, public testimony that has not already done so, 
Now will be the time of forever hold your peace. Seeing and hearing no desire. That will conclude the public testimony with respect to the chamber. One last call through central staff to Donna Bowen. Did we lose her? So Donna is not with us, but unfortunately, um, very good. So from my perspective, I know that uh, I'll allow um, um, at Council Lodge, uh, Aaron Murphy was the lead sponsor in this to, to, to bring us out, but this was very informative. It was great to have the superintendent here clearly committed uh, to uh, the partnerships, uh, breath of fresh air, seeing her willing to collaborate uh, with our mayor and our um, police commissioner. Uh, that has not been the case uh, over the last several years with her predecessor and the fact that they're willing to recognize these issues and put a plan in place to uh, address them is very comforting for me given that we've been at this and it's been somewhat contentious between the council uh, and uh, BPS over the last several years over these instances where people were not having uh, their child's um, bullying and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and assaults and sexual assaults and, and assault and batteries addressed properly uh, in many instances ignored uh, to the point where they were coming to city councilors to have those matters addressed. So um, again, breath of fresh air, uh, excited that she was here and excited that uh, she's committed to uh, to try to uh, get that number down to zero, which is in an ideal world, we'd love that. So without further ado, the chair recognizes the lead sponsor to close right. us out, City Councilor Aaron Murphy. Thank you, um, Councilor Flaherty. And I agree um, that it was great to hear from um, Mary Skipper, the new superintendent, knowing that she's jumped into this role and we really wanted to reschedule the last hearing and to focus on not how will we preventing incidences that's an important issue that we know we'll continue to work on but how is her role in this you know as the superintendent now in boston how are we going to make sure that once an incident happens students families everyone can feel safe and we know that there is protocol in place and that we're really and i really am was happy to hear that she is committed along with her team to work with the community knowing that they can't do it alone at the school level we have to be working with not just the police and the community leaders but also businesses and us here on the council to all come together and the mayor also and she said she's had many um, meetings already with the new police commissioner knowing that we can't work apart from each other to get this right for our students and that every student in every school deserves to have a safe environment. So we'll continue. And I also know that um, Desi's involved, right? We can't pretend that we didn't get in this place for many reasons because the report that came out last year from Desi really shone a light on the data that BPS doesn't always share with us. So it is, um, I'm hopeful that with this new administration, they're not trying to hide the numbers, they're trying to get to answers. So I'm um, gonna roll up my sleeves and work alongside the new administration to get this right for our kids. They deserve it. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Council Murphy. So with respect to docket 0888, a hearing to ensure that all incidents of bullying and violence are properly reported to ensure a safe environment for all students and staff from the Boston Public Schools and the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice is now adjourned. Thank you.